Mori said for his team to get better, they have to compete more internationally to see where they fit in. And for Notre Dame, this is one last game for these players to put on the gold helmet again to play for a Hall of Fame coach, Lou Holtz. It's an unbelievable opportunity, especially in a bowl experience on the road. This is an opportunity of a lifetime for these players. It would be amazing. From the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo, Japan, we celebrate 75 years of American football in Japan on a historical day as the Notre Dame Legends team, coached by Hall of Famer Lou Holtz, takes the field against the Japan national team in the Notre Dame Japan Bowl. Tom Hart alongside former Notre Dame All-American Aaron Taylor. And Aaron, this is a great opportunity for both squads. Absolutely, Tom. For Japan, this is a measuring stick. Head coach Kiyoyuki Mori said for his team to get better, they have to compete more internationally to see where they fit in. And for Notre Dame, this is one last game for these players to put on the gold helmet again to play for a Hall of Fame coach, Lou Holtz. It's an unbelievable opportunity, especially in a bowl experience on the road. This is an opportunity of a lifetime for these players. It would be a major upset for Japan to come out with the win, but we're in the same site where Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson. Anything's possible in the Tokyo Dome. Kickoff is next. After a 13-hour flight, the Notre Dame Legends team is set to take on Japan here in the Tokyo Dome, also home to the Yomuri Giants. And you see the infield set up on the left side. That's where Notre Dame will kick off to the Japanese national team. And this is a team that is made up primarily of semi-pro players that play in the X League, which is a league made up of corporate teams. Players work throughout the day at their respected corporations and then afterwards go out and play some football and on the weekends. Scott Sinja will handle the cook-off duties for Notre Dame. And Noriaki Kanashita, who's been in Falcons preseason camp over the last couple of seasons will handle the return duties for Japan. He is their most experienced player after spending a lot of time in NFL Europe and going to three straight camps with the Atlanta Falcons. Kanashita, 26-year-old, takes it from the four and has a nice wedge in front. will take it all the way out to the 34-yard line. A Lou Holtz staple sweating about special teams, Aaron. Special teams is always something that Coach Holtz emphasized, and this is a unique experience because you don't have many days or many practices to be able to put special teams together. It's often an area that gets overlooked, but today they made a good play there, and hopefully that will continue throughout the rest of the day. Take a look at the Japan starters. Murakame, there's... Sports. It's in the game. Center is a 31-year-old who plays for the IBM Big Blue team. And behind center is Tetsuo Takata, a 27-year-old quarterback who stands 5'11", 185. And some confusion before Japan gets a first playoff here from the Tokyo Dome. But when you talk about the advantage for Notre Dame and wanting to play Lou Holtz-style football as Japan uses the timeout before their first snap, this is your typical David versus Goliath Notre Dame size versus Japan speed. Well, there's no question. This Japanese team 
is very well coached and very well disciplined. They're also a very quick team, and they're going to have to play like that today because they're going up a much bigger offensive and defensive lines for the Irish. When you have things like that, I think defensively, Notre Dame can expect this offense to be able to try and air it out, create some seams, and take advantage of a team that, quite frankly, hasn't had much opportunity to play together. This Japan national team just played last week against Nihon University, a group of collegians and former Nihon University players in a tune-up game under head coach Kyoyuki Mori, who's a head coach of the Deers in the X League and a former linebacker at Kyoto University. So they've played together some, but stress that they this is basically a semi-pro team. Takata in that game threw for 324 yards and three touchdowns. They go four wide, and we'll see a lot of spread offense from this Japanese team. Takata gets chased from the pocket on first down, and will tuck it up and run past the 40, and that will leave second and short. Uh, Johnny Sanders came up to make the stop for the Notre Dame Legends team. Well, what fun it must be for these former Fighting Irish players to be back in the gold helmets. This is just a great opportunity. This defense is primarily the younger players of the team. There are a lot of these guys have played recently. So some of these guys know how to play together. But again, Tom, they haven't had much time to play together. So it's going to be interesting to see how this defense gels throughout the night. Chris Fromm just left the field after the first play. And here's a zone read for Japan. And this is Furutarni. And he's got a first down on a run off the right side. So Chris Fromm out of Saugus, California, now a financial advisor for Morgan Stanley Smith Barney, leaves the game. And that is a common theme for Notre Dame this week, Aaron, trying to get old guys like yourself back into playing shape wasn't exactly easy. Not at all. A lot of these guys are a little older. I think their will and their want to play football was a little bit more so than their body's ability to do it. A lot of pulled hamstrings, a lot of muscle tears, which is indicative of teams not being ready physically to get back out there on the football field. Ben Foos nearly jumped but got back in time. Takata has to scramble again and a flag on the play and he pushes one complete to Takishi Akiyama, a 23-year-old who plays for the Fujitsu Frontiers. I would anticipate that we see what during the season would be considered oh, oh, sloppy play. No, no, <laughs> I think it'd be very sloppy, especially early on. You have to realize that neither of these teams have, A, played together very well, but there was no film exchange. So they're both kind of flying in the dark, not necessarily knowing what the other team is going to be doing. Japan apparently was supposed to send some game film from that game last week and never did. And the Japanese team has no chance to watch Notre Dame because they only had eight practices. So this is literally two teams showing up and playing in somebody's backyard in the dirt. The Japan coaches said they actually went back and watched some film from Lou Holtz's coaching days to try and get a feel for what Notre Dame may do. The problem there, as Takata goes deep on second down and it's knocked away by Ron Israel, the problem there is that a lot of the guys that they would have seen in pads and playing for that team are now on the sidelines coaching for Notre Dame. Guys like Chris Zorich, Reggie Brooks, Tim Brown are here as honorary coaches. Yeah, there's a lot of old guys, but true to style, Lou Holtz has a plan, and he likes to do what he likes to do, which is run the football to play attacking, fundamentally sound defense, and that's what he can expect. It's almost like being in a time warp. You look at the gold helmets and the blue jerseys, we have guys that are anywhere from 23 years old to 52 years old out there on the field, but one thing stays the same with Notre Dame football, and that's playing aggressive. And on the screen, Koji Yoniyama... 26-year-old from Fujitsu with the catch. So Ron Israel make the stop on the previous play. After a four-year NFL career, now makes his home in Voorhees, New Jersey. And he went head-to-head -head and will be covering Noriaki Kanashita today. They played together with the Amsterdam Admirals of NFL Europe in 2005. So there are a couple of guys that are familiar with each other, but that's where the familiarity's in. Another flag and a shovel pass underneath to Furutarni, and Furutarni gets brought down by Mike Goolsby. 
I think we're seeing a lot of mistakes early. You see a Notre Dame defensive line getting called off. They're doing a hard count. Japan is doing a good job of drawing those guys off sides. Everybody's excited to play. They're in Tokyo. They've been playing and, and prepping for this game for a while. It's been a long time since a lot of these players have played, so it's not uh, it, it's not a situation where it's unexpected that you're going to see these mistakes early. My guess is that as the game goes along, it, it smoothed out a little bit. And would your guess also be that Lou Holtz would cut them some slack when it comes to mental mistakes on the football field, no matter their age? Uh, not so much. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's been a, a fun week for this Notre Dame Legends team, especially for guys who never got the chance to play for the Hall of Fame. Well, that's one of the things that the players talked about a lot. Uh, particularly Ambrose Wooden. He said one of the things that was most exciting for him to be able to come back was the fact that he got to coach for Lou Holtz. Players talk to each other, and we all kind of compare coaches and compare eras, and one of the things that Ambrose heard was how well Lou Holtz coaches teams and the philosophy that he taught, and he was really looking forward to do that. The pass complete to Noriaki Kanashta. Kanasha, as I mentioned, spent a few summers in Falcons camp and will likely be playing stateside this fall with the New York team of the new United Football League. He was the only guy when he came out for practice that had his own uniform. He wore his Amsterdam Admirals practice jersey, his own helmet, the Admirals game pants. You can be kind of showing off there a little bit, right? You, you scrubs are, are wearing the hand-me-downs. I actually have a brand new uni. Look what I did. And look what Japanese offense is doing right now for the Japan team. They're doing a good job of spreading Notre Dame out. We talked about that quickness that they had early on. The spread offense is designed to get the ball to their players' hands in space and doing a good job right now of keeping Notre Dame off balance. Another stop for middle linebacker Mike Goolsby. Who at 6'3", 240 has a definite size advantage on the Japanese team looking for Kanashita deep that time and coverage downfield by Benny Gilbo. Gilbo a very good cornerback played from Notre Dame from 95 to 98 and led Notre Dame in interceptions in the 96 and 97 seasons with four each and with coverage like that you can understand why. So a trip to Japan for Benny Gilbo then here this month it's back to school literally he's an English teacher at St. John Birchman's High School in Louisiana four wide and one back for Japan Takata and a first down that time as he fits one in Mitchell Thomas with the stop for the Notre Dame Legends team Takata doing a very good job at distributing the ball. He threw that in a very tight space. Mitchell Thomas had good coverage, but Shimizu doing a good job of doing an out route and getting the first down. Japan is finding a way to move the chains, and Notre Dame seems to be a little bit off balance right there. Simple stick route, puts the ball where it needs to be. The receiver did a good job of getting past the chains to be able to get the first down. Japan seems to be clicking right now on offense. Notre Dame doesn't seem to have an answer. First and 10 on the Notre Dame 29-yard line for Japan. This is the opening drive of the Notre Dame-Japan Bowl. And it goes straight up the gut that time. And a nice carry for Masahiro Ishino. That was a good changeup, Tom. They just ran a simple inside power. We've seen some outside runs. We've seen them spreading them out. Here they just pull the right guard, try and get it up inside, and do a good job of gashing that Notre Dame defense, getting the guards up on the linebackers, creating some seams, which is what you want to do in that power game. Very good play calling by the offensive team of this Japan team. Melvin Dansby was in the backfield, but couldn't bring the runner down. Good balance for Japan so far offensively. Tenth play of their opening drive, facing a second and four now. They try to swing it out. And right at the marker again goes Furutarni. And a host of Notre Dame tacklers in there to stop him right at the line. This is a fantastic opening drive for Japan, Aaron, because it's giving them a lot of confidence. There was some questions on both sides coming into this game as to which team was being disrespected more. And you know, typical of a Lou Holtz team playing up the other guys. But they still think, both sides think they have something to prove here today. There's no question. Japan, again, we talked about at the top of the game, this is a measuring stick for them. They're playing against a real live American football team. Granted, these are older players, but this gives them a chance to see how well they measure up. And right now, they're doing a pretty dang good job. Incomplete that time. Looking for Hashigawa. 
And incomplete from Tetsuo Takata, the Japan quarterback, has had an efficient first drive. And fourth and in inches now for Japan. They've got a pretty good field goal kicker, Daisuke Aoki, who nailed a 53-yarder during his regular season. He's one of the 10 collegians on the roster. They're going to go for it on fourth and short. 12th play of the drive for Japan to get things started. And they try to go off tackle and nothing happening for Furutarni. That's an interesting play call. They tried to go off tackle, but that Notre Dame defense, particularly up on the uh, defensive line, did a great job responding to that. One of the key fundamentals that Coach Holtz talks about winning football games is controlling the line of scrimmage. We see Notre Dame do this right now. They're penetrating. They have a run blitz. We see a great job of who? Number 41, Mike Goolsby, showing up again, getting his hat on the football and stopping them from converting that first down. Great job by the Notre Dame defense. Three tackles in this opening drive for Mike Goolsby. That'll be a long flight home for the Joliet, Illinois native, 26-year-old. 13 hours for this Notre Dame Legends team to make the trip over to Tokyo. Ambrose Wood is going to start a quarterback for Notre Dame. That's right, Ambrose Wood, the defensive back, who played for Ty Willingham and Charlie Weiss, won the battle of attrition among other quarterbacks. We'll also see Tony Rice today. Here's a look at the starters and the youngest player on the Notre Dame team, Thomas Beamendorfer, who was playing in the Hawaii Bowl last season for Charlie Weiss. And Ambrose Wood, in just a couple seasons out of Notre Dame, now makes his home in New York City. And the Baltimore native will have Jay Vickers in the backfield. Bobby Brown, Jay Johnson, the wide receivers. High formation, typical, but the reverse maybe not so much for Lou Holtz and Bobby Brown. Leading wide receiver in 97 and 99 for the Irish gets taken down. Classic Lou Holtz play call trying to take advantage of a speedy and athletic defense. That was one of the things he was concerned about is their speed and athleticism. So a good way to change that up and get a defense to play and stay at home is to run a reverse right out of the gate. Unfortunately, that was poor execution, and Japan's defense comes up with a good stop early on. Kihira is the biggest guy up front for Japan. Six feet even, 242 pounds. And a big-time... Size advantage for the Notre Dame line. Swing pass for Notre Dame on second down and fighting his way for an eight yard gain. Well, it's Cole Lau. Just a simple screen pass out to the left. It's a nice, safe play call for a quarterback who hasn't thrown the ball very much since high school. He did a good job out there, but Japan does a good job of funneling and forcing the ball back inside, and you see a lot of red shirts around the football. If you're a defensive player and you want to stop a screen, you got to be able to pursue. Japan did a good job there. Comes up with a big first down for three and out for the Irish. First crack at it for Ambrose Wooden at quarterback. He hadn't played quarterback since his prep days at the Gilman School in Baltimore. And Notre Dame will punt it away. Both teams have had a shot at it here in the early going. A solid Japan drive stalls on fourth and inches, and Notre Dame gives it right back to the Japanese national team. Coverage continues from the Tokyo Dome right after this on CBS College. College Football Hall of Famer Lou Holtz just recently enshrined back on the sidelines. 100 wins as the head man in South Bend and now trying to lead a Legends team to a win in Japan against the Japanese national team coached by Kiyoki Mori. It's been a thrill. We talked about it a moment ago, but I know it's been a thrill for a lot of these players to have a chance to not only play under Lou Holtz, to be involved in practices underneath him, and a flag on the play after the ball was knocked away by Ivory Covington. But also Jeremy Akers, one of your buddies on the offensive line, kept, kept a blog throughout the course of the week in the trip, and he said, you know, I regretted I didn't keep a journal while I was at Notre Dame, so... He's had it up online at onemoregame.blogspot.com, and he talked about on the trip over before the game getting a feel for what Lou Holtz does even before 
essentially an exhibition game in terms of game planning everything to a T and what he's going to say after we win the game. That was classic Lou Holtz. He always had a plan, and if you follow the plan, he expected to win, and that's the way he's coached his teams. That's certainly the way that the team that I was on that he coached, we never walked on the field and ever expected to lose, and it was part of that preparation and his attitude to even have the notes about what his after-the-game win speech was going to be that allowed him and his teams to be so successful. Takata takes off with it up the middle after the flag. And so far, this Japan offense has found ways to move the football there. They have, and this is good pressure up front by the Notre Dame defensive line. They're running some sets. The quarterback pulls the ball, comes back down, so it means it's good coverage down the field. So Notre Dame, as they start to settle down, will figure out some tendencies of what Japan's trying to do. And you have to understand, a lot of these guys, it's the first time they've been on the field for a long time, so I'm sure things are moving faster than they're used to, but they seem to be settling down now. It's Mitchell Thomas had to stop that time from his linebacker spot. Takata wants to throw, and he'll get taken down in the backfield, the first Notre Dame sack of the day. Great job by Anthony Brandon coming off the edge right there. Good job, Notre Dame's defense, coached by the defensive coordinator Gary Darnell, being aggressive. And one of the ways that you have to be able to do to be able to stop the spread, rather, is to cause pressure. Notre Dame making no bones about that. Coming off the edge, Brandon does a good job and just tried to get cut and got up and stayed with it and created a good play. 30-year-old Anthony Brandon finished his playing career for the Irish, seemingly in 2000. When you come out for that final game of your senior year, you figure you're never going to put the jersey back on, right? You would think. And that's what's so special about this game. This is the opportunity. This is really, I mean, I've had football dreams myself where I was like, man, if I could just go out there and play one more game, one more this, if I could do that, do this. And this is a great opportunity for these players. These guys have real jobs. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're financial people. And they get a call from a former coach or a former player asking them to come and participate. It's an unbelievable opportunity. If my body wasn't so brittle, Tom, I would have tried to be out there too. <laughs> Well, Japan trying to take advantage with speed and youth. That's 23-year-old Takeshi Akiyama with the grab. And first down from the Notre Dame 34. Ball batted away in the backfield. And once again, good pressure from Notre Dame was Joe Brockington, who was second on the team in tackles with 108 in 2007. Had a career-high 16 tackles against the Navy option offense. Joe Brockington doing a good job, just unblocked there, gets his hands up just like your coach to do when you're coming free, doesn't jump and leave his feet, which is also something you're taught to do when you have a clear shot at the quarterback. But he's an educator now in Pennsylvania, and I bet a lot of his students are looking forward to watching old Joe Brockington out there making plays again. Another flag. This Japanese team is in Notre Dame territory for the second time in as many drives. Your guess, Aaron? Are you, are you going with illegal, <laughs> illegal participation? Yeah. My, uh, my understanding of Japanese is not quite up to speed. <laughs> Well, but, but Lou Holtz may not know it either, but he knows that, that that's a few flags against his squad already. Look at that face. It's like he hasn't skipped a beat. He's on the sidelines, and that's what the players talked about was the experience of him. But you have to understand the practices were so intense heading up to them. They didn't have very many of them, but there were two a days, and Coach Holtz did not care how long it had been. He wanted his players to do the little things right and to practice hard. He was very demanding as they got ready for this ball game. Shoei Hasegawa. Forced out of bounds by Ambrose Wooden, who's playing both ways for Notre Dame today. He's also the starting quarterback, more comfortable on the defensive side of the ball where he was a cornerback. Ambrose doing a good job out in space and just wrapping up, but you mentioned that he didn't find out till midweek that he was even going to play quarterback. As injuries happened, as Tony Rice hurt his calf, and there were different things that happened throughout the week, and guys started going down as their bodies were failing, Ambrose was one of many players this week that have stepped up and rose to the occasion and played out of position. Big stick after the grab, and I think, you know, we talked about these guys wanting to come back and play and getting in one more game. Those are the dreams, coming up and drilling a guy one last time. Well, when you're a little kid, 
before you even played football, maybe when you were, you know, first started playing pop Warner, you had a dream of making a big play and making a big hit. And this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for these players to be able to come up and make plays like this. It's like a bowl game environment. There's a lot of festivities, a lot of hoo-ha dinners throughout the week, but for them to be able to go on the road and play together with almost a ragtag bunch of guys that have never played together, it just had to be an incredible experience, and a lot of them shared that this is something that they'll look forward to or look back on for the rest of their lives as being one of the defining moments of their sports career. Bobby Howard was the man who had that stick for Notre Dame a couple of plays ago. And it's third down for Japan. They're Second possession, both drives have gotten into Notre Dame territory. They turned the ball over on fourth and inches. The offensive coach for Japan is kick back, relax, kind of like Aaron. Just Headset on, sitting in the stands. I would have had some popcorn and maybe a toasty beverage. <laughs> Somebody called the vendor over. Takata lets it go and drop. Would have been a first down for Akiyama. The Japanese team in their bios were asked what their approach would be for this game and a lot of it was lost in the translation but Akiyama simply said I'll try sometimes trying not good enough that's right if you try and feed your dog he dies and right there he tried to catch the ball and didn't you have to be able to go out there and make plays and that's a rare miscue from a Jap uh, Japan team that is very well coached and very disciplined Fourth and six here in a 31-yard field goal attempt for Japan. Daisuke Aoki drills it, and Japan takes an early lead, scoring on their second drive to take a 3-0 advantage over the Notre Dame Legends team. A nine-play, 38-yard drive for Japan after Notre Dame went three and out. And a 31-yard field goal for Daisuke Aoki. And Notre Dame's in a hole with under four minutes to go in the first quarter. 3-0 Japan, and Notre Dame will be back on offense after Daisuke kicks it off to him. 22-year-old from Senshu University. He plays for the Green Machine at Senshu University. He's one of the collegians on the team. Here's Sanders, 32-year-old, back to return for Notre Dame. Notre Dame Japan Bowl from the Tokyo Dome. A group of Notre Dame legends coached by Hall of Famer Lou Holtz. With about a week of practice showed up to take on this team. And a solid return for Sanders. And that's where Ambrose Wooden will be back under center for Notre Dame. What are you seeing so far in this game? Well, so far, it seems like the Notre Dame offense has had trouble moving the football. They haven't been able to get anything going offensively. They completed the one screen pass but on the ground. They didn't really know what to expect, what sort of defensive fronts they would see. So I would imagine that during their last time off the field that they'd have to make some adjustments. On the other side of the ball, the defense is bending but not breaking. They did give up three points, but it's misused by the Japanese team more than anything that has them only up by three at this point. And now national champion quarterback Tony Rice is under center for Notre Dame. First play, a toss, and this is Jay Vickers who gets hit in the backfield and taken down. A negative play for Notre Dame. And big number 99, Mitsunuro Kihira, back to make the stop for Japan. So Tony Rice under center playing for his coach, Lou Holtz, for a second time. The South Carolina native back for Notre Dame. A special relationship between Tony Rice and the Hall of Famer head coach. Kind of a love-hate father-son relationship almost. Coach Holtz was notorious for riding Tony hard, but he did that because he knew the potential that he had. And, and, and when Tony Rice came into Notre Dame, he was a Prop 48 student, a kid that didn't really have a chance. And by the time he left, his name is synonymous with Notre Dame football. And a big part of that, and, it, and he credits it, is the, the tenacity and the care that Coach Holtz took riding him and building him and creating him offside. to be the player that he was. Flag against Japan offside. Notre Dame fans are very familiar with Tony Rice's shortcomings as a passing quarterback. And Lou Holtz harped on him a lot about that throughout his college career. But regardless, the guy was a winner. 40-2 as a high school quarterback at Woodruff, South Carolina. And all he did was win in South Bend. 
including a national championship. 28 and 3 is a starter. And what counts as a quarterback position, you have to be a leader, which Tony exemplified perfectly, but you have to win. 28 and 3 speaks for itself. 39 total touchdowns while he was there. He was fourth in the Heisman in 1989, won the championship in 1988. All this young man has done is succeed on the football field, and that's a testament to who he is and his character. Part of Lou Holtz's first recruiting class at South Bend, and here's a first down jaunt for Brandon Hoyt, who's seeing time at fullback, the former linebacker. 2005 team for Charlie Weiss, who's one of two captains, along with Brady Quinn, had a team high 92 tackles. Great job. You see a little miscue right there, a stutter step. But Brandon Hoyt breaking tackles, being very physical, running with his shoulder pad level a little bit high. But the Japanese team seeming to have some trouble bringing down such a big player who, coming into this game again, was trying to play linebacker. But because of injuries, he ended up playing not only fullback, but tailback. Six feet, 230 pounds for Hoyt. And out of the shotgun, Tony Rice hands it off. And this is Jay Vickers on the left side. Vickers hasn't been completely away from football. He's been playing flag football out in Fresno, California. He's an associate athletics director at Fresno State on the development side. Father of three. And he'll be back in Fresno for two-a-days and will be able to go out to the field and talk to, uh, talk to his, some of his current players and students that he worked with within the athletic department say, hey, yeah, I, can st I can still strap it on. I hey, can go out there and bang a little bit. If football's in you, it's in you. Whether it's flag football or playing in an all-star game halfway across the world, Jay Vickers has proven that he's a football player and doing a pretty good job this far. Well, Tony Rice uses a timeout here. And he'll go to the sidelines and, and talk with Lou Holtz. And how many times did Notre Dame fans see this during the national championship season? We talked about Tony Rice's lack of numbers and, and you know he was heavily criticized for not being as efficient as he should be as a passing quarterback but when you talk about him as a winner I think it's worth noting especially given the schedule that Notre Dame played during the Lou Holtz era and who Tony Rice was going up against he was winning games against guys like Steve Walsh, Rodney Pete, Major Harris, Craig Erickson, Gino Toretta guys who did put up big numbers but all Tony did was win. That's all he did, and he did what he was asked to do. One of the things that makes a good coach, which Coach Holtz as a Hall of Famer obviously is, is that he leverages his team's strength and his players' strength. To be successful on the football field, you have to not only recruit well and have the right players on the bus, but you have to have the right players in the right seat. He never asked Tony to do anything that he couldn't do, and Tony responded well. He played within himself, which was run the football, be a winner, and lead the football team, and that's exactly what he did and why they had so much success. Under center now in a second and seven. Notre Dame trails 3-0. And Rice took a bunt from his teammate, Cornell Taylor. And the play was ruled down when Rice went down. You know, what's interesting to me when you talk about the dynamic of Tony Rice in, at Notre Dame, and you mentioned earlier that he was a Prop 48. And, and obviously, one of the most successful Prop 48 student athletes in the history of college football having won a, a national championship but how did he change the dynamic of recruiting in South Bend considering at the time he showed up on campus Notre Dame didn't even allow red shirting until 86 right well he changed the dynamic a lot Notre Dame also didn't accept a lot of prop 48 students at very stringent academic levels but there was something about Tony and Coach Holtz went to bat for him that he believed in this kid and he had to prove himself when he got to campus. He didn't just show up and, and get anointed. He had to show up and prove himself in the classroom first before he had the opportunity to go on the football field and he was an African-American quarterback. A lot of people uh, I think sometimes it slips and falls through the cracks but there weren't a lot of African-American quarterbacks that were given a chance and Tony was one of the the premier guys to be able to come out and go to a school like Notre Dame and kind of be an odds beater. And I think it really started to open things up for not only quarterbacks in general and Prop 48 students, but African-American quarterbacks uh, specifically. Well, that is as good an example as any that the mid-80s was a long time ago. And that was a different era, not only in our country, but especially in college football. I mean, think about the, the as shovel pass falls incomplete. Think about the guys who were role models at that time where being a black quarterback was a big deal. 
You're talking about Warren Moon and Randall Cunningham. And even when Notre Dame took on Virginia in the opening game of the season, it was a big deal that Virginia had Sean Moore, an African-American, at quarterback, and Notre Dame had one as well in Tony Rice. You don't even consider that these days. No, especially not when you have a guy like Terrell Pryor, it's a sophomore at Ohio State, who are already talking about a Heisman and these young kids coming in and playing right away. Not only are they contributing, but what's happening is I think you're seeing African-American quarterbacks getting a chance on the high school level. And with the advent of the spread offense, there's more opportunities to be able to leverage and use that athleticism. But guys are getting more developed as passers as well. So I think there's been a dual-fold kind of scenario that's gone on where they're not only getting the opportunities but they're taking advantage of those opportunities and it's as it starts younger in the high school arena we're kind of seeing that transform onto the football field currently but I think you're right a much different climate today than it was in the mid 80s fantastic punt from Jeff Price you got a great roll on the end of that one the Texas native will pin Japan deep and an opportunity for the Notre Dame defense here is Japan Get off one last play before the quarter comes to an end from their own eight-yard line. In play action, Takata wants to run with it. Flag on the play. The pass is complete. Pardon me, it was incomplete. Out of bounds to Shohei Hasegawa. That will bring an end to the first quarter, but with the flag on the play, Japan will be facing a second down as we wait on the flag. These are experienced officials over here in Japan who work the collegiate league. And Mike Goolsby, the Notre Dame captain on the defensive side, for now will get the option from the Whitehead. Little hold backside. Notre Dame was bringing some pressure and the left tackle. Hirusha Hiramoto had trouble being able to block the Notre Dame defender. Japan. Notre Dame brought their PA announcer Mike Collins along on the trip and we'll wait till we hear from him so Aaron and I can figure out exactly what the call was. <laughs> Regardless, Japan has a 3-0 lead. They're pinned deep in their own territory with Notre Dame's defense waiting to tee off. We're through with one quarter from the Tokyo Dome. The Sensoji Temple in the Asakusa District in Tokyo, the oldest Buddhist temple in Japan. And we we'll see some great culture on this trip that the Notre Dame Legends team got a chance to take part in. And it ran the gamut. Aaron, they even, some of the traveling party even got up as early as 5 a.m. to go check out the Tokyo Fish Market. Yeah, they had an opportunity to do a lot of things, and that was the bowl game aspect of this. It is a business trip. They came over here, they wanted to win the football game, but they also wanted to have some fun. After that visit that they had to the temple, a lot of them shared that they bought uh, a bunch of samurai swords. So <laughs> that must have made for an interesting ride home with TSA coming back through <laughs> customs with eight samurai swords in their bags. Third possession for Japan. A 3 nothing lead for the Japanese national team against these Notre Dame legends. Takata has a strong arm at quarterback, but he overthrows his receiver and intercepted by Ron Israel. And Notre Dame has the takeaway. Just a simple overthrow by the quarterback Takata and Ron Israel, who led Notre Dame in interceptions in 2000. And was a journeyman in the NFL, four different teams in four different years. Just doing a good job as a safety, coming over the top, helping his cornerback out, which is a good play have a good nose for the ball and the quarterback just throws it right to him the ball was overthrown but ron israel comes up and does a great job doing what he should do which is helping out his cornerback on the outside three interceptions for israel during his notre dame career all of those coming in 2000 and then hampered by injuries his senior season so notre dame back on offense and Tony Rice will take off and run for the first down and still on his feet in a gain of about 15 on first down for Tony Rice. Those legs still work for the 41-year-old. Look at the old man go, 41 years old and still got it. And that's what we as Notre Dame fans and former players, I think, enjoy seeing and remember seeing so much is Tony Rice's ability to make people miss two, three tackles right there. Japan really having trouble bringing down all Irish ball carriers, but Tony Rice at 41 years old does a great job of getting the first down right there. That's the Tony Rice Notre Dame fans remember seeing. 
won the Johnny Unitas Golden Arm Award. Finished fourth in the Heisman balloting. Even though he wasn't known for his arm, and they're incomplete, trying to swing it out for Jay Vickers. It, it is asking an awful lot for the Notre Dame quarterbacks, Tony Rice and Ambrose Wooden, to get on the same page. I mean, that was just an incomplete pass, a ball that stuck in Tony's hands. But to get on the same page with your receivers with very limited practice. Time. No question. The passing game is all about timing. Not only are they learning new plays, but knowing how far to lead a receiver, when a guy's going to make his break, what they do in particular situations, when a corner squats or the safety comes over the top. Those are all particulars that you need multiple practices to be able to do. Very hard to establish any sort of passing game with limited practice at the interception by Israel has been great shape here and here's a little option for Tony Rice and Rice gets stood up lost the football at the 19 yard line and it seems as if Notre Dame has recovered Brandon Hoyt in there cleaning up for Notre Dame Tom it's unbelievable to me and, and, and somewhat surreal to see Lou Holtz calling option plays with Tony Rice in real time and see him still being effective in work. This is just a weak side option. He reads the end, comes down. It's a keep. He has an option to be able to pitch to Brandon Wade. He decides to keep it, take it up inside. It's been a long time since he's played, so he didn't have the three points of pressure, which Coach Holtz always talks about, which is the body, the elbow, and the hand to keep those balls from popping out like that. Shoulder pad level a little bit high, but Notre Dame gets lucky and retains the ball. That'll set up a third and five on the Japan 20 for Tony Rice. Played at Notre Dame from 1986 to 1989 after sitting out his freshman season. For Prop 48, Shingo Hiruma will leave the field for Japan. From his strong side linebacker spot. You know, both teams will go very deep in this game if for no other reason than trying to keep players fresh. There's no question. Keeping players fresh. But you have to realize Notre Dame only came over with 57 players. They lost another five. So heading into this game, they only had 52. Very limited numbers. So they have to be able to rotate to keep guys fresh. And again, it's hard enough when you have small numbers and have people that have experience playing with each other. But then you add the dynamic where none of these guys have played next to each other it could be very difficult to move the football but Notre Dame seems to be doing a good job on this drive two tight ends for Notre Dame and they go with power football but it's Brandon Hoyt who stood up and stopped on third down Hoyt had a chance to get some time with NFL teams the Bears and the Colts after playing linebacker for Notre Dame finishing in 2005 it's clear that Notre Dame has gone to that run game and doesn't appear to be throwing the ball very much. So what we're seeing out of Japan is more run blitzes. Yuji Aoki, number six, also flashed on that and forced that play out to the outside so that number 44 could make the tackle. So Notre Dame will attempt the field goal to tie the game, a 37-yard attempt. And it's good for the Notre Dame Legends team. In the second quarter, we're tied at three and the field goal by Scott Sinclair. Scott Sinja has Notre Dame on the board. Now makes his home in Cincinnati. Played his high school ball in Florida before coming to South Bend. And now the vice president at UBS Financial Services in Cincinnati. Tied at three, 12.32 to go in the second quarter from the Tokyo Dome. Tom Hart, along with former Notre Dame All-American Aaron Taylor. Glad you're along with us as we get our football fix here in the middle of the summer from the 10 yard line. A solid return out to the 32 yard line, 22 yard return for Japan that time. And I know that you are a man with brittle bones, but watching some of the guys that you played with, guys that played before you were at Notre Dame out there on the field, you get kind of an inkling. You know, maybe maybe you should have made that 13 hour flight and strapped on the pads. Well, I, I got to be honest with myself, Tom. And, and one of the things that I know is that I could get hurt in a pillow fighting, man. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it'd be realistic. Much like Coach Reggie Brooks, who tried to suit up and practice halfway midweek, didn't even make it through half of practice before he pulled a hamstring and went right back to coaching. Well, hamstrings are the body's reminder, aren't they? There's Hasegawa with the catch for Japan. You know, one thing, both 
reading and researching for this game, he constantly came back to the players who are back in uniform for Notre Dame today, and and not just their love of campus and sense of belonging within the Notre Dame community, but specifically what it means to be part of the Notre Dame football community. Well, when we talk about it, it's the Notre Dame family, and it really is. We talked a lot about, and I remember Coach Holt saying that, you know, you're playing for the Lady on the Dome. When you put the golden helmet on, you're not only representing yourself and your team, but all the players that came before you and all the players that came after that will come after you. So there really is a sense of family and belonging that's special that has a lot of former players coming back to the university. Reggie Brooks uh, has come back to the university and is working with him. He's the manager of Monogram and Football Alumni Relations. Chris George, the former Lombardi winner comes back he's coaching in this game the defensive line he's the manager of student welfare and development and athletic athletic administration a lot of former players come back defensive lineman Bryant Young had a great career in the NFL he's back there as a defensive GA now there's something about campus when you're part of that Notre Dame family where it's like you got to go out into the real world but just like family you always come back home first and ten now for Japan And on a zone read, they'll keep it on the ground. Ishino will have a first down scamper, a 12-yard gain. Kanashita lost his helmet on that play, blocking downfield for Japan. And the 29-year-old Ishino carries it for a first down. His semi-pro team is a Panasonic Electric Works Impulse. And what a flag will bring this one back. I, you know, as an outsider, I wonder how that sense of, of duty and family has changed, if at all, with Notre Dame's recent struggles on the field. Well, it's certainly tested it, and it, it's really kind of shaken the tree a little bit and really kind of defined who the true Notre Dame fans are and who are the ones that just want to be there when, when Notre Dame is winning like it has historically. But I think at its essence, the Notre Dame alumni specifically and, and the players primarily, once you've been there, it's just like family. You don't have to like each other, but you always respect <laughs> each other and you always come back home and you always treat somebody like family. And that's been the overwhelming uh, attitude and experience of former players through this kind of rough patch of Notre Dame football that looks like it could be turning a corner and heading back to the glory days but once a uh, part of the Notre Dame family and the Irish you always are and I think more than anything former players still feel part of the program first and 18 now for Japan and dropped in the backfield is Takata and another Notre Dame sack Melvin Dansby finds his way into the backfield the 34 year old finished his Notre Dame career in 97 a try captain that year on the Independence Bowl team Melvin doing a good job from coming from the left side, busting through a double team. Looked like there could have been some miscommunication on the offensive line, but the former Irish captain and former teammate of mine doing a great job. He had a sack in 2000 when Notre Dame played the Hamburg Blue Devils coming up big. So this is Melvin's second international game as an alumni and showing that he's still got a little bit of wiggle in those hips. Team time off. That was a 14 to 10 win against Hamburg that you talked about. Notre Dame has made a few international trips. Of course, playing Navy in Dublin in the mid 90s, and they'll take on Navy here again in a couple of seasons overseas. Back in 1979, the first time the varsity team played an international game, they beat the Miami Hurricanes in the Mirage Bowl 40 to 15. The freshman team in 1971 played in Mexico City. Ron Goodman had four rushing touchdowns. They won that game 80 to zip. So this is the fifth international experience for Notre Dame football as a whole, with two of those play being regular season games. Ivory Covington, who is uh, in the game today for Notre Dame playing left corner, had a pick on the last play of the game against the Hamburg Blue Devils to seal the win. Second and 24. You mentioned Notre Dame on the brink of establishing that success after the big Hawaii Bowl victory to close last season. What is your outlook this year for Notre Dame? Well, I think when you look at this Notre Dame team and kind of the progress that they've had over the years, I would expect that Notre Dame gets 10 wins and possibly back into a BCS game. They have their hardest game during the season 
versus USC at home, and you look at the rest of their schedule, there's only two, four true real road games. So you couple that with the fact that they have some tremendous offensive firepower coming back with Jimmy Clausen and arguably the best receiving core in the country with tight end Kyle Rudolph and uh, Michael Floyd, the, the receiver, and uh, Golden Tate great baseball player as well. They've got some tremendous offensive firepower, but the offensive line returns intact, and that's been the thing that's been missing for the Irish is any sort of toughness up front and any running game. So if they're going to make that run and get those 10 wins, they're going to have to shore up the offense. And on the defensive side of the ball, John Tenuta with his aggressive blitzing style defense, I think is going to really surprise some people this year. Notre Dame football just may be back. You mentioned that USC game. That's on October 17th as Japan gets one in right in front of the sidelines, in front of the Japan bench. Notre Dame will have a week off leading up to that USC game, and they'll be following a home game against Washington. So that's a nice three-week span taking on a struggling Washington, Washington program, then a week off, and then Pete Carroll and company show up in town. Yeah, so it sets up very nicely for the Irish, and it's just about taking it one week at a time and gelling as the season goes on and getting more consistent play out of the quarterback. Jimmy Clausen last year, for as many yards as he threw in as great of a Hawaii Bowl as he had, was inconsistent. He did get better as the year progressed. So if he can continue that maturation process, and with Charlie Weiss taking back over the offense, the Irish uh, can expect to score some more points and have a shot at really surprising some people this year. Dice K. Aoki hailing both the kicking and punting duties today for Japan. has already drilled the field goal, and he puts one out of bounds at the 30-yard line, and Notre Dame will be back on offense here. And Tony Rice back out to run the offense for Notre Dame. 34 yards on the ground for Notre Dame, only one pass completed. That was a swing pass from Ambrose Wooden, who started the game at quarterback, to Cole Lau, the fullback. And a whistle before the play gets off on first and ten for Notre Dame. I would imagine that would be a delay of game. There seemed to be a lot of time by the time they broke the huddle and came up to the line of scrimmage. That's one of those things that Coach Holtz is not too happy about. You don't want to shoot yourselves in the foot and kill your momentum right out of the gate. You start out first and 15. It's a different play call, and you don't put yourself in an advantageous position to win. But again, that is an absolute sign of this team being inexperienced and not playing together. The plays are taking longer to get in and getting taking longer to be called at the line of scrimmage. So on first and 15, Rice will roll and lets one go deep downfield and incomplete off the hands of Jay Johnson, who was met by a couple of Japan defenders, including Daisuke Ueki. Ueki did a good job of separating Johnson from that football. It's a play action rollout to the right. Tony Rice does a good job, looking very athletic. Very pretty ball, tight spiral, throws it into traffic right where it needs to be. But the defender just comes up, puts his helmet on the football. Great timing by the safety, jarring the ball. Twenty-eight-year-old plays for the Fujitsu Frontiers. When he was asked how he would get into this game and have success, he said simply, "Play with speed and low." And at five-six, he's got to play everything low. <laughs> hey, you got to work with what you got. That's been one of the things that coming into this game, again, we talk about the mismatches, particularly on the offensive line of the ball. Japan's defensive line averages 246 pounds, whereas Notre Dame's starting offensive line averages 290. So it's 45-pound differential, basically, 44 pounds between them. So you would think, especially with the timing pieces that we talked about the passing game, that Notre Dame, particularly with Coach Lou Holtz, would focus on the run, and that's exactly what they've been doing. Tony Rice... Exit a little banged up, and here's Ambrose Wooden back at quarterback for Notre Dame. The former defensive back, pump fake, pulled it back, and still wants to throw, and it's nearly intercepted. Makiochi there for Japan. You look at Ambrose Wooden, and you say, well, well, he was always on the defensive side of the ball. How good could he be a quarterback? Well, at the Gilman School in Baltimore, he was a fantastic dual threat quarterback. He set the Maryland State record with 7,261 career yards. He was also the kicker and the punter at the Gilman School. In fact, he only played defense his freshman year. He had another pretty good 
Notre Dame standout on the defensive side of the ball in high school. Victor Abiyamiri, who followed him, they both came to Notre Dame together. Punt handled at the 35-yard line, and it will be about a nine-yard return for Japan. Japan, number 83, Susan. Japan's offense has to come out and be able to execute the football. They've pretty much put their stake in the ground that they're going to try and throw the football and take advantage of their speed advantage that they have on the outside. But they've had some drop passes and some miscues. But you have to credit Notre Dame's defensive line. They're doing a great job of creating pressure and making Takata scramble and throw on the run, which is helping out that defensive backfield that hasn't played a whole lot together. But right now, Notre Dame's defense holding Japan, which is an explosive offense, so only three points, not having played together very much is doing a very good job. Takata, 10 of 17. They stack the wide receivers on the top side, and they're going to run it straight up the gut. Vinny Gilbo at the bottom of the pile for Notre Dame gets up shaking his head. I imagine there would be some Advil consumed on the flight home for these Notre Dame guys. That's one of the things they talked about was how their bodies had to wake up when they went to those first couple practices in South Bend. It had been a long time since they had not only exercised as much as they'd done, but getting used to just simple things like the weight of the helmet and the weight of the shoulder pads was a challenge for some of these guys. So I think to their credit, they're showing up and playing on game day. But yeah, I think the learning curve was a little steep getting used to hitting again. Under the short shotgun. And a first down run for Japan. Another look at this play. It's, it's almost reminiscent of the pistol formation that Nevada runs that Notre Dame fans will see up close for the first game of the regular season. Notre Dame's pass defense better come that week, too, because Kopernik's a good quarterback. He can throw it for a lot of yards. But I think with John Tenuta back there in that aggressive blitzing style defense, Nevada better come ready to play as well. Colin Kopernik, a quarterback for Nevada. An established, experienced quarterback on first and ten. Takata wants to throw, and incomplete. Missed opportunity for Japan. Hasegawa, number seven, was running free on the slant and was wide open. And again, it was the pressure from Notre Dame where Takata had to roll out of the pocket. He missed him. You can see him coming from the left side of your screen with his hands up. This could have been a touchdown on the back side. You see it right there. If he could put that ball in the seam, he may have had a chance to get in the end zone, but certainly right there waving, I'm open, I'm open, give me the ball. With the quarterback throwing and running on the ball, or running, having to run and throw the ball on the run, couldn't complete it. So second and ten now for Japan. You mentioned John Tenuta having more of a role in defensive play calling this season. Tenuta made his mark at Georgia Tech as perhaps the most aggressive defensive coordinator in the country when it comes to blitz calling. He would be a nightmare as an offensive lineman, a former player, to have to prepare and block for those defenses. He shows things that you don't see at all on the college level and rarely see on the pro level. It's much more uh, experience and in-depth and intricate type schemes where they bring a lot of different people. They create overloads. They really test your pass blocking rules. So it puts a lot of pressure on the offensive line. It's the defensive version of having to prepare for the option, whereas defenses always talk about they play the option team one week out of the year, and it's very hard to prepare for. That's what John Tenuta brings to the defensive side of the ball. Offenses rarely see that type of blitzing style defense with the overloads and that sort of schemes, so it's really hard for offenses to gel and prepare for it. Hashigawa seemingly had a step that time, but Takata couldn't finish it. Second time they tried to hook up on consecutive plays, and perhaps Mike Goolsby's footsteps had a role in Hashigawa short arming that would be catch so Japan will punt it away good pressure from Notre Dame on the punt and it will go out of bounds at the 21 yard line and that's where Notre Dame will take over once again on offense we talked about your expectations for Notre Dame this season Aaron you expect 10 wins but there will be a lot of adjustments to get used to with Tenuta more involved defensively and now Charlie Weiss offensively. A 
I think but both of those changes, Tom, I think are going to help them. It is going to take some adjustment, but they've had a full spring to be able to do that. They'll have a full fall camp to be able to prepare for that. And I think it'll be a welcome sight for Notre Dame because everybody's going to be on the same page. And they have a lot of confidence in both Charlie Weiss as an offensive coordinator and John Tenuta as a defensive coordinator. Out of the eye, Rice will hand it off. And there's room to run for Jay Vickers. And Vickers takes off on first down and looking to find some speed from his youth. He's got plenty of it, but not enough. Taken down at the one-yard line. And 31-year-old Jay Vickers a yard short of a touchdown sprint. What an incredible run using his quickness and vision to be able to stutter step. The hole's not there. Bam! Drops his head, hits his shoulders, cuts back side, and then like a gazelle or maybe a giraffe, hits the <laughs> long strides, kicking it in those hamstrings. We talk about a burning and the last minute gets caught, but what a great run by Jay Vickers. And talk about giving something to your offense to be excited about. Those type of plays right there change momentum and they're game winners. 77-yard run for Jay Vickers. He was asked about his speed and he said, hey, at the April tryouts, they had me at 4-5 in the 40. There's Rice over the line. It was a little bit of liberal timing. I think they gave him the first 10 yards before they hit the stopwatch. <laughs> but showing great speed on that play. And Notre Dame winning on the goal line is a staple of Pulse's plan on how we win. We have to win the goal line. We get down there in the red zone. It's also about toughness. So I would think with Notre Dame's size advantage that they have up front, they'll keep it in the ground and punch one in. Bob Morton, the center. 6-4-3-10. Tony Rice will follow him on the right side towards the line and in. Touchdown, Notre Dame. And Tony Rice, who rushed for 39 touchdowns in his Notre Dame career, can add another one with an asterisk as he scores one in Tokyo. Great job getting some push up front. That play is called 10 wedge, where everybody just kind of pinches into the side to get some pushing. And 28, Cole Lau, the tailback, getting a little bush push from behind to make sure Tony gets across the line of scrimmage. Great job by the Irish control of the defense and the line of scrimmage and punching one in. First touchdown of the game belongs to Notre Dame. Scott Sinja on to attempt the extra point. And he bangs it through. It's been a successful trip for Sinja. Notre Dame up by a touchdown. Hall of Fame head coach Lou Holtz with his quarterback Tony Rice and a three-play scoring drive for the Fighting Irish. See the bush push right there by Cole Locks doing a good job, number 28, making sure that his former quarterback gets across the line of scrimmage. But that's what Lou Holtz likes, winning the battle up front and controlling the goal line. That's how you win football games. A 10-3 Notre Dame lead. Ten straight points for the Fighting Irish after Japan scored on its second drive of the game. Their first drive came up short as they went for it on fourth and inches instead of kicking a field goal or attempting a field goal. So Notre Dame will kick off. Scott Sinja has had a busy day already in Tokyo. Field goal, an extra point. He's handling the kickoff duties. Third kickoff of the day for Sinja and... Japan has had solid returns on the previous two. Koji Yonayama set to return, and this ball will be picked up at the 10-yard line by Yonayama. Good footwork. Yonayama takes it out to the 29-yard line, a 19-yard return for Japan. So the 26-year-old has Japan in good starting field position once again. This Japan team needs to finish. They've been able to move the ball, get down near the red zone, but haven't been able to convert anything except the three points. There's been drop passes along the way. Their offensive line seems to be sagging and giving up some pressure. They've got to be able to put something together in this drive. They've got five and a half minutes. It's a second quarter. Plenty of time to be able to go down and score and get some points on the board and change the momentum of this ballgame. On first and ten, a flag, and another drop in the backfield for the Notre Dame defensive line. Hard to tell what happened on that from this angle, but a coverage sack nonetheless. 
Good job by the defensive line hustling to the football. Derek Curry jumped. We've seen mistakes. Lou Holtz not a fan of mistakes. <laughs> no, he's not. In fact, he actually kicked Ambrose Wooden out of practice for throwing an interception. The defense all week getting ready for this game had done a great job of, of keeping the offense in check. So Ambrose, who's part of that defense, comes over, runs a couple plays on Wednesday and Thursday to get ready for quarterback, throws an interception. Ambrose, get out. Get your butt out of practice. <laughs> kind of falls apart is you know is his confidence is a little shaken but some of the older players Tony Rice and Reggie Brooks and Zoritz kind of chuckled went over to him put their arm around him and said Ambrose take what he says he's not mad at you he's mad at the mistake don't take it personally Ryan Roberts knocks that pass away in the attempt from Takata we talked about you know different era we we're talking about Tony Rice as a black quarterback and what he accomplished at Notre Dame it's also a different era when it comes to coaching kids these days and handling with kid gloves and knowing who you can push and who you can't. Back when I played, Tom, we were tougher. <laughs> and I think there is a generational difference. And you have to remember, Coach Holtz comes out of that Woody Hayes coaching tree at Ohio State. So part of his deal is to be able to test and challenge players, to be able to create so much pressure and so much competition during the week that on Saturday it's easy. And that was certainly in that situation what Ambrose or what he was doing with Ambrose Wooden and a lot of players. And I felt the wrath of that myself. One time I was a sophomore on the offensive line, missed the block. The defensive lineman came in, hit the running back. Coach Holtz kicked me out of practice. I said, no, no, coach, I got it. The second team guy comes in. He kicks him out, too. He said, run the play again. So Notre Dame's offense comes up with 10 players in line of scrimmage. Nobody knows where to line up. The tackle's next to the center. There's a lot of confusion. Now everybody's looking. Run the play again as if Aaron Taylor was in there. Quarterback comes up to the line of scrimmage. Blue 42, blue 42, set hut. Defensive lineman comes across. Bam, hits the running back. Knocks him back in the backfield. And Coach Holtz looks at me and says, see Aaron Taylor? No difference. Doesn't matter whether you're in there or not. <laughs> so the message was sent loud and clear that you have a job to do and people are counting on you. And if you're going to be in there, you better do something. That taught me a very important lesson as a sophomore that I carried through the rest of my career there. Yeah, the lesson is you don't matter. Yeah. You're screen door. <laughs> I went to therapy after that. <laughs> First down for Japan. Laces out. Is there a uh, is there a reason to think, and given some of the, the stories about Lou Holtz and and his you know kind of browbeating as a head coach in the sideline that 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 wouldn't work with today's kids? I, I think it'd be challenging, and I think he would have to pick. Uh, pick his places a little bit more. These kids are internet stars from the time they're 13, 14 years old and they have a following, so they come in almost with a false bravado at times. I don't think that players are gravitating towards kind of the harder edge coaches. You're seeing kind of the Urban Myers, the Pete Carrolls, the Mac Browns having success, the Bob Stoops questionably. Uh, not his success, but his coaching style coming in and gravitating more towards the player friendly coach, the Bobby Bowden's of old. Because I think what happens, these young kids are getting too much success early, and the expectation level is ridiculous. It was mentioned to me earlier this summer that this is the first generation of athletes where everybody got a trophy in Italy. <laughs> right. They really don't know failure in that regard, but when you talk about different coaches even within his own family very big disparity in between Lou Holtz and his son Skip who's the head coach and very successful at East Carolina very different coaching styles coach Holtz was in your face he was involved in everything uh, he was a guy that would challenge his players there was no sort of friendly relationship although it was a light atmosphere coach Holtz had an open door policy we always knew that we could go to him and to this day current players or former players that come back to him he certainly steps up for it but skip Holtz at ECU has done a great job on the conference USA with his team he's more of a hands-on that type of player friendly coach that we talked about now, there's no mistake that he's the boss and he's running the show but I think with today's climate and with today's athletes you have to get a little bit more involved in their life and not necessarily be there only their coach you have to wear a lot of different hats tight end Jeremy now is talking about playing 
for Lou Holtz during his college days and now playing for him again. And he said, back then, he was just a coach. I mean, there, when it came to personal relationships, there wasn't a lot there. He said, you know, the guy was addicted to Diet Cokes and milkshakes from McDonald's, <laughs> and then he'd stay up and watch game films into the wee, wee hours of the morning. That's what he did. So it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit different. You, you, listen, not that I'm arguing with the success he had, but we're seeing a lot of changes now with coaching styles and how, how coaches massage those very fragile egos in many ways these days. And, and I think it's a testament to the coaches that are able to do that and having success because it is a different climate. And the coaches that we're seeing having success are having to change their styles. It used to be where you had a plan, you did what you did, and it worked no matter what. Well, as things change and as things progress, as players change, coaches are finding that they're having to change their systems and their coaching styles. People are going more towards the spread, so you recruit a different type of player. It's become more competitive, particularly like in the Southeastern Conference. So there's a lot of changes. There's a lot of moving parts, and the coaches that can be the most successful over the time are the ones that are able to adapt. Face mask on Japan. That'll lead to a Notre Dame first down. Tony Rice and Ambrose Wooden, excuse me, Aaron, have split time at quarterback so far for Notre Dame, with Rice leading his Fighting Irish Legends team to its lone touchdown so far today. Ten flags between the two teams already, and we're not yet through with the first half. Again, I think it's reminiscent of teams that aren't playing or used to playing with each other. Little bobbled exchange right there between the quarterback and running back Cole Locks. And that's to be expected, but still it's no excuse. Coach Holtz was holding these players and all of his players of all eras to a very high standard. And he would encourage players through his own style that we've talked about, about raising their level of game to that level. And I'm certain that they're going to hear about this at halftime, the mistakes. The mistakes and the penalties aren't helped them out. It happened to be that at that time it was uh, Japan, but both of these teams are shooting themselves in the foot unnecessarily. A bumbled exchange that time between Rice and Locks, as you said. And you go in the locker room, you might get a little spittle on you and, and shoot out a little bit, and then Cole Locks has to think about the fact that, well, he's got to go back to work on Monday as a trader at the Chicago Board of Trade. <laughs> Nobody there is going to care what he did over the weekend. <laughs> That's right. So certainly no stranger to pressure. And here you see Colts Holtz very upset at another miscue by this offensive team. The players shared with me that during the week, things changed a lot. They were literally drawing plays up in the dirt and having to come up with blocking schemes to cover all scenarios. It's very difficult as an offensive lineman to be able to come up to the line of scrimmage and not know what defense you're going to see. It's clear that Japan has figured out that Notre Dame's not going to throw the ball very much, so they're doing a lot of run blitzing, which means that Notre Dame in eight practices could not have accounted for run blitzes and all the different things that Japan's going to throw them. So there's going to be some miscues, but with that size advantage, and if you get a hat on a hat and stay fundamentally sound, which I'm sure what Coach Holtz is telling them in the huddle, because that's what we heard every single time, you're going to have success. The offensive line as a unit is a relatively young team. Everything's relative in this game, but relatively young to the rest of the roster. David Quist is the oldest, the right tackle. He finished his playing career in 96. He played on Holtz's final four teams. Here's Vickers. Somebody loses a shoe, and Vickers takes it out over the right side. Jeremy Akers is the second oldest. He's a guy that I played with from 93 to 96, a 23-game starter, and played in the NFL and played internationally for the Rhine Fire in the NFL Europe. Casey Robin lost his Adidas that time. It, it, it's interesting to me as we talk about Notre Dame and, and, and the basics of playing offensive line, the Adidas stripes actually play a role in alignment. Yes, they do. 
Coach Holtz's philosophy from the day we stepped on campus, the very first thing we learned as freshmen was stressing the little things. We're going to win because we're paying attention to the little things. So I'll never forget, as a freshman, we showed up early before the vets. We practiced how to get into the huddle. And when we lined up, we had Adidas shoes. We lined up stripe on stripe. If you didn't, you got yelled at and had to run, and there were all sort of things uh, that we had to do. But his point was, if you're in the huddle, and you're focused on your stripe being on the other player's stripe and, and everybody being in their position, then you're going to come up to the line of scrimmage and worry about where your fir first step's going to be. You're going to worry about where your hat placement is. You're going to worry about whether your hands, what those landmarks are. He stressed the little things from the very beginning so that it would carry over not only to what we did on the field, but also into our lives. Just another reason you've never seen Notre Dame wear pack rats. <laughs> That's right. Nobody would know where to line up. <laughs> 10-3, Notre Dame with the lead, an injured Japan player on the field for the Japanese national team. And as a reminder, this Japanese national team is a mix of 10 collegians, and the rest are semi-pro players. American football has been active in Japan now for 75 years, introduced by a couple of Americans, and obviously during World War II, it went on hiatus for some time, and then they returned to continue coaching the, the kids in high schools and colleges in Japan. And their professional league, the X League, plays a championship game every season about the same time as the Super Bowl, actually in, typically in January, called the Rice Bowl. It's the Tokyo Super Bowl. But what it, the biggest difference is that these guys play for their company teams. They don't get any extra income for playing football for their company teams, and they do it essentially on their own time. You've got teams like IBM, the Obix Seagulls, Panasonic Electric Works, Works Impulse, and this Japanese national team part of the International Federation of American Football, won the Senior World Championship in 99 and 2003, and then just narrowly lost the title to the United States, which just started fielding a team in the IFAF recently. And the United States eked out a double overtime victory in 2007. A lot of fans of Japanese American football, or American football in Japan, were really excited about this game because they thought that their team, which we considered an underdog coming in. They thought that their team would be better at executing plays and would have more speed and could, could maybe catch Notre Dame napping. Maybe that was the case for the first two series for Japan on offense is the Notre Dame players had to get used to the speed of the game. It definitely took them a while to get adjusted, and you have to realize part of Notre Dame playing against and practicing against themselves, they had no idea how fast this game is going to be, particularly now that they're playing on AstroTurf to boot. So I think it took a little bit of adjustment, but it's the typical David versus Goliath, the speed versus the brawn. When you have an opportunity and a choice between the two, I would always take a powerful, big running game versus a speedy, athletic, light defense. It's the exact same thing that we had in 1993 when we faced Florida State in the game of the century, as they called it. Florida State had Derek Brooks. They had some tremendous defensive players on that side of the football. And we were this slow Midwest team that ran the football. And the best way to do it is to punch teams in the mouth. That's what we did to Florida State. And it looks like that's what Notre Dame is trying to do to the Japan team today. And that's what they try to do with Jay Vickers, 6'1", 230. Already has the longest play from scrimmage today, a 77-yard run where he's brought down just shy of the goal line. It's been a warm couple of practices as you see some guys bothered by cramps. It's been a warm couple of practices in the Tokyo Dome. They didn't have the AC on the first time Notre Dame was in. And in fact, because the Yomuri Giants, the baseball team, and now Tony Rice is on the Notre Dame sideline. Had a game earlier this week, and the pitching mound was still in place. That cost Notre Dame an opportunity to get out on the field. Ambrose Wooden back at quarterback. Vickers fights his way back towards the line of scrimmage. That is likely the final play of the first half. Well, you talk about how hot and warm and humid it is in, in Japan, and particularly in Tokyo. That certainly is what's allowed or, or caused a lot of the, the muscle cramps. So I think guys are going to go in at halftime, get dehydrated, go back to the drawing board, and figure out what it is they need to do and come out and have a chance in the second half. It's a 10-3 lead for Notre Dame over Japan in the Notre Dame-Japan Bowl. And we're at the half from the Tokyo Dome. 
start the second half of the Notre Dame Japan Bowl with the Fighting Irish Legends team on top 10 to 3. A Johnny Sanders set to return this one for Notre Dame, and he takes it at the 14 yard line. Sutter stepped to start, loses a man, runs over his own man, and here goes Sanders. I don't know if a Johnny Sanders is colorblind, but it doesn't matter what jersey you're wearing, he's going to bowl you over. All our care coach, all I do is break tackles. All I do is break tackles. <laughs> Brian Molvina, number 54, taking one for the team and getting the charge. Keeps your eye on the Johnny Sanders. Great job using some lateral quickness and vision. <laughs> Gets upfield, drops the shoulder, hits Molvina, and then breaks tackles, keeps his legs driving, and does a good job. You see four defenders from Japan it takes to bring Sanders down. Great physical run. Sanders telling his teammates about it. So far, Johnny Sanders and Jay Vickers have had the most fun out there for Notre Dame, it seems. Both big play guys. Ambrose Wooden with his second completion of the day. This is Vickers in a flag on the play. That might be holding against Notre Dame. Vickers cuts it back, puts the ball in his left hand, and he is off and running again inside the 20. Forced out of bounds at the 15-yard line. Unfortunately, Tom, that's going to come back. I think it's going to be a hold on number 88, Bobby Brown, the great former Notre Dame receiver. But Jay Vickers showing a tremendous amount. Look how soft his hands are catching this ball at the backfield. I think the hold's going to be right there. Maybe it was number 11, Jay Johnson as well. But Vickers crossing the field, showing speed, great fundamental, switching the ball from his right to his left hand. So, bam, he can stiff arm the Japanese defender there and then drop another shoulder. Great prime example of how much more physical and bigger this Notre Dame team is than the Japan team on that very play. Naoki Kosho, who was the recipient of that Jay Vickers stiff arm, is only 5'8", 185, and he's the outside linebacker for Japan. So the Bobby Brown holding brings this play all the way back. Brown, now an attorney in South Orange, New Jersey. Can't appeal that one, can you? No, but I'm sure he would try. He did a great job in both 97 and 99 when he was the Irish leading receiver and just a, a great testament to the student athlete that goes through Notre Dame. Not only a good player on the field, but also great in the classroom. Went to Notre Dame Law in uh, 2006 and then opened up his own practice. Here's Wooden on the right side. He finds some room and he scampers for a first down. You know, Ambrose Wooden is a good example of that as well. His senior year playing for Charlie Weiss, he left every Sunday during football season to fly to New York City after their Sunday meetings to interview with Goldman Sachs and now makes his home in New York and works for Goldman Sachs trying to balance. It was a little different for you. You were trying to balance the opportunity to play in the NFL once you got to that spring side. But even during fall, during the fall, Ambrose Wooden was playing and the Baltimore native planning ahead and interviewing as any other senior would. Yeah, I was trying to balance my appetite for Snickers and pizza and working out, getting ready for the combine. But oddly enough, I flew on an airplane from Chicago with Ambrose Wooden coming back from that very interview that he had with Goldman Sachs in New York. And we had a chance to catch up after the season. I was going to speak at the Notre Dame banquet that night. And I was really impressed with him as a person and as a player. It was fun watching him. But he was covering his bases and doing what he needed to do. He had aspirations of maybe walking on or, or being a free agent on the team, but he was covering in his bases and it turns out that he landed the job at Goldman Sachs and here he is getting another chance to play. That's what we're talking about when this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And the Baltimore native, the shotgun, hands it off inside and this is Brandon Hoyt, linebacker turned fullback for the day with the carry. Wooden chose Notre Dame primarily because of its academics. He was recruited by Ty Willingham. And he said one of the biggest reasons coming out of the Gilman School in Baltimore that he decided on Notre Dame was at that time, Notre Dame was sixth in the nation with a 73% graduation rate for their African-American athletes. It's pretty impressive. I mean, Notre Dame's overall graduation rate is 95%, I think, for the athletics program, second only to Harvard and Princeton. And I know that's a big reason why I went there. I think at the time that I went through, their overall graduation rate was 97%. Now, I knew I wasn't the strongest student in the world, but I knew I wasn't 3%. So if I went to Notre Dame, I was going to get my degree and at least have my bases covered from that end. Ambrose Wooden with another opportunity under center for Notre Dame. Playing both sides of the ball today. The defensive side and the 
quarterback and some miscommunication, and Lou Holtz has the hat off, and he's in the grill of Brandon Hoyt. And, and Brandon Hoyt is a linebacker who didn't even know he was going to play offense till midweek of the game. So that's the level of expectation the Colts Holtz has yelling at a player who's had two days to prepare and only eight total practices. And that's been a testament to this Notre Dame team. We've seen so many players, not only uh, on, on offense, but also on defense, having to fill in for other guys. Ambrose Wooden moving to quarterback. Tight end Marcus Thorne having to go to running back because Ray Zellers pulled a hamstring. So that only left him one tight end, Jeremy Nahn. He's been banged up with a right knee. Brandon Hoyt is a linebacker moving to, li uh, moving to running back. So there's so many players that have had to step up and fill roles midweek. And I think it's a testament to the fortitude and the desire and the willingness to play as a team that these Notre Dame players are showing. And another great punt from Texas native Jeff Price. His first rolled inside the 20. This one gets all the way down to the one yard line. So Price, who's a Ray Guy semifinalist his senior year, only had two career punts before his final season at Notre Dame. Now has a couple of good ones here today. Japan has switched quarterbacks. Shun Sugawara is now in, and his first attempt is incomplete. Trying to find Shimizu. Pocket collapsed on Takata a little bit, and he drifted to his left and tried to drop the ball into the zone, but it was good coverage that time and took a hit late as that pressure from that Notre Dame's front seven bringing the heat. Mentioned earlier how this Notre Dame team was selected. Former letter winners received a letter asking them if they wanted to be part of tryouts in the spring. And about 100 guys showed up on campus to try out for the team. They whittled that down to roughly 60, even fewer than that, made the journey over to Japan. But even after those practices, the tryouts, the two-a-days, they were looking for an opportunity to come out and lay some wood. And, and that time they did, knocking another Japan player out of the game. And Japan already working from under the shadow of its goalposts and under their second string quarterback, 23 year old Sean Sugawara. Japan's going to have to be very careful here, Tom, with the pressure that Notre Dame's been able to get on the quarterback because of the field position. They're perilously close. They have to either be able to run the football and get it out or throw the football quick, or they could take a sack in the end zone, which would, of course, be a safety. Gary Darnell, Bill Lewis, Chris Zorich. Coaching on the defensive side of the ball, there's no question what John Tenuta would do in this situation. Send everybody. Everybody and their brother. Second and ten. No chance to throw, and there's your safety. Matt Hasbrook gets in for the second. Two points for Notre Dame to add to its lead. Matt Hasbrook just did a good job of staying with the block. Stan relentless getting after the quarterback. You see Sugawara right there with a little smile on his face. You got to be able to throw the ball away. No, have some pocket presence. But that was the first play that he comes in and he wants to make something happen. He's looking downfield, but you have to be able to know where you are on the football field. Notre Dame comes up with a huge stop. Back to the Tokyo Dome in a moment as Notre Dame leads 12 to 3. Matt Hasbrook, 27-year-old from Indianapolis with the safety for Notre Dame. He started his college career at Michigan State, finished up at Notre Dame in 2004, and looking like he's still in playing shape, makes a play for Notre Dame defensively. We talked about the once-in-a-lifetime play. I mean, to be able to go on the road and get a sack and have an opportunity to put on the Golden Dome and make a huge play in this game that is creating a little bit more of a gap. Notre Dame's now leading, of course, 12 to 3. This is the experience where we talked about the top of the game where it's one more game, one more opportunity for Notre Dame. And some of these players, this game will actually be the highlight of their football career under the dome. A lot of highlights in this trip for Notre Dame. Here's Johnny Sanders from the 19-yard line. Had a massive return. Last time he runs into another blue jersey and takes, <laughs> takes down some Japanese players as well. Sanders is running through everything on his kickoff return. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to be in a, in a foxhole with that guy. He's shooting anybody. But I, I think 
what we're seeing is the physical nature of Notre Dame football. And this is what Coach Mori for the Japan team was talking about. For them to get an idea of how good they're going to be, they're going to need to play physical international talent. And that's exactly what they're seeing. You can't simulate players running that hard and trying to tackle players like that in practice. But this is going to be very good experience for this Japanese team. First and 10 from the 42 for Notre Dame. Ambrose Wooden handling the snaps here in the second half after Tony Rice led Notre Dame on a touchdown drive in the first half. And nothing doing inside for Notre Dame and Wooden that time on the carry. It's been a busy week for Notre Dame. These players, the coaches in their traveling party over here in Japan. And it's been a week of sightseeing, tourist activities, dinners and one of the highlights was when former Mets manager Bobby Valentine who is still over in Japan managing in the Japanese Pro League had a chance to get up and speak to the dinner and the first thing he did was remind folks that he is the only manager to lead teams in the American League the National League and the Japan League and go to the World Series in both countries and then of course he noted I'm also the only guy to have been fired from all three of those <laughs> spots. But what's little known about Bobby Valentine in addition to that is that he was once recruited to play football at Notre Dame. Yes, he was, and there's a great story about that. At one point, Coach Parsegian, and, and Bobby Valentine was a running back, had on his left side out in the snow outside in the middle of the winter the offensive line on the other side of the ball he had the defensive line and coach Parsegian said Bobby if you come here look at the backs of these guys you're going to get to run behind them but if you go somewhere else look at these guys over here pointing to the defensive line if you don't come here you're going to have to look in the faces of those guys seemed to be a pretty simple equation Bobby Valentine of course picked wrong and went to USC and to this day claims that that has created a family feud and his family, his decision to go to SC instead of Notre Dame. Valentine was drafted and signed by the Dodgers in 69 and went on for his major league playing career, then, of course, of course his managing career in both countries. It wasn't much outside of that lineup. There's a big lick put on Vickers. That is a live ball, I believe, on a lateral. And a backwards pass, and it goes out of bounds. Japan unable to get their mitts on it. It will be Notre Dame ball at the 13-yard line. The ball floated a little bit, giving the defender some time to come up and be able to separate him from the ball. Jay Vickers left open and exposed. Kind of a telegraph play, but they had to be able to do it. You see the short-armed attempt to go to get it, but what a great job by that Japan defense to play aggressive and come up on the football. Masashi Fujimoto had the lick on Vickers there, who was hung out to dry a little bit. Well, going back to Bobby Valentine and his recruiting trip, he stayed with Joe Theismann on his visit. And Coach Parsegian at one point finally told him, you don't have to sell a Cadillac. We are a Cadillac. A Cadillac's a Cadillac, baby. It's going to gas guzzle and get you from A to B and be dependable and reliable. And that's the message he was trying to send him. And there's so many great recruiting stories. I mean, I've, I've got plenty of my own. A lot of former Notre Dame fans may remember a running back named Dorsey Levins. We played together in Green Bay, had a tremendous career. He was a running back. He was my host while I was there. Dorsey said, Aaron, whatever you do, don't come here. It's cold. I hate it. I'm leaving. So Dorsey transferred the next year and went to Georgia Tech. I went on to win the Lombardi and be a captain and a two-time All-American. It worked out a little difference from him, but I always joke with Dorsey whenever I see him that, thank gosh, I didn't listen to his advice. Notre Dame to punt it away following the penalty. No fair catch taken by Kanashta, and the 26-year-old quickly brought down by the Notre Dame special teams. And Ed O'Connell, the long snapper with the stop. O'Connell was going to get some reps at tight end this week. And then somebody looked out there and said, wait a second. This is our only long snapper. We can't risk this guy getting hurt at tight end. We won't have anybody to get the ball back there. So no tight end duties. He's left just with long snapping. Sugawara is back in a quarterback for Japan. His second series after taking a sack and a safety last time out. And here's an option for Japan. And Takuya Furutarni, 32-year-old from the Obik Seagulls and Kansai University with the carry. 
Japan had some early success getting to the edge and spreading the defense out and also going back up inside with the run game, but they've gotten away from that a little bit, trying to take some shots downfield. I don't know if they're uh, feeling pressure or, or feeling pressed to be able to score some points quickly, but establishing the run game, especially with so much time left in the third quarter, may be a way from a play-calling standpoint to get them back in this ballgame. Try to the zone read there, and Yuichi Khan with the carry. The zone read isn't as effective when uh, you hold on to it too long. Yeah, you got to be able to pitch the ball. It's a simple read. If the end crashes down, you pitch it. If he stays out and floats, you cut up underneath. And that time, the Notre Dame defense did a great job of crossing the face of the Japanese offensive line and destroying his read by getting penetration. Tosuga Wara, four years younger than the starting quarterback, Takata. Tosuga Wara is 23. On play action, lets it go on the slant, and complete, and room to run. And Wooden playing both quarterback and defensive back with the stop after the first down by Naoki Maeda. That's almost a West Coast style offense out of the spread where you deliver the ball very quickly off the play action to suck the linebacker up. Mike Poolsby bit number 41, bit on the fake, creating the space to be able to allow Sugawara to deliver the football. Great job of play call and execution by the Japanese team. Goolsby will be benched next week, first and ten. <laughs> Here they are again. With that short shotgun and Futarni goes to the right side. You know, we've seen a pretty creative Japan offense when it comes to formations and plays. There's not one specific identity with this team you could say outside of the spread. They do a lot of different things within their offense. Well, they do, and, and I think what it comes down to is not just about the X's and O's. It's also about the Jimmys and Joes, and you have to be able to execute. you got to be able to catch the football. You have to be able to win the battle up front. So schematically or not, the Japan team isn't executing the things that they need to do to give them some success to win. Notre Dame is winning the job up front. They're playing good bend but don't break defense. They're being able to rush the passer, so it doesn't matter what they draw up in the dirt. It's not going to work if you don't execute it. Free shot that time for Ryan Roberts on this broken play for Japan. Third and eight. be a big conversion for the Japanese team. They're down by nine halfway through the third quarter. They need to get some momentum because Notre Dame, if they're going to stay true to form, is going to be able to run the ball out. And you see right there a tipped pass taking too long. Good job by the defensive line. Again, you have 51 Melvin Dansby getting his hands up. That's the second time we've seen him do that in this ball game. He's making his presence felt up front. The Notre Dame defensive line is winning their battles. So put your head in it, isn't it? Melvin Dansby won the 1997 Nick Pretoshanti Award, which is a very prestigious award that symbolizes or is given and voted by the players to the, to the player that they feel best exemplifies the qualities of the famous fullback, which is teamwork, dedication, commitment. Melvin, as a former captain, was given that award in 1997. It's an award that I won, and it's one of my most prestigious honors that I've received in football. Japan. Japan uses a timeout here, their first of the second half. Tom Hart along with former Notre Dame All-American Aaron Taylor. And Melvin Dansby playing for Hall of Fame head coach Lou Holtz. What a busy week for Lou Holtz and the Holtz family. Anniversary coincided with his trip to Japan. With his wife Beth. And just prior to leaving was enshrined in the College Football Hall of Fame. 100 career wins for Lou Holtz with the Fighting Irish, second only, of course, to New Rockney. It's quite a treat, Tom, to sit here and watch in real time one of college football's greatest coaches. Coach Holtz is the only coach to take five different teams to a bowl game and to go to four different bowls with four different teams. He's an unbelievable coach and, and done such a great job and added so much not only to the game of football, but the game of football off the field. No good that time for Daisuke Aoki, and Notre Dame will have the ball when we return to the Tokyo Dome. Well, it was a great opportunity for Japan, but the drive stalls and the field goal is no good for Daisuke Aoki. To impress the coaches this week with his booming kickoffs, but that one... 
just pushed. And so Ambrose Wooden back at quarterback for Notre Dame, a 12 to three lead for this Notre Dame Legends team. And a gallop on the left side and looking for room to run. A couple of nice spin moves from Brandon Hoyt. He doesn't move like a linebacker, does he? And he's got a Notre Dame first down. Brandon Hoyt doing his best PlayStation impersonation, hitting the O button, spinning. Pretty impressive for a linebacker, but it shows you the athleticism as you take out those big old pipes of Brandon Hoyt right there. He's obviously stayed in great shape. Notre Dame offensive line creating the holes. One thing that I've noticed in the second half is the physicality of Notre Dame. The Japanese players aren't wrapping up and taking the running backs down with the first shot. It's the second, third, and fourth shot, and they're not swarming enough to be able to allow plays like that. Notre Dame clearly a much more physical team than the Japanese team. Seven carries for 42 yards for Hoyt. Makes his home in Parlin, New Jersey, and straight up the gut goes Jay Vickers. Vickers came out of Tallahassee to South Bend as a high school player. Finished his career in 99, his freshman year, he fractured his shoulder. And then also injured his senior year. This is for Jay Vickers, a second chance to play for Lou Holtz when he showed up as a freshman on the practice field. Holtz told the team the first day that their toughest player was his freshman running back. The next day, Jay Vickers broke a bone in his shoulder and was lost for the season. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Injury's been a part of most athlete stories, including my own. And I've never met an athlete where it didn't end with injury, where you have the thought of what could have been. If I had only not gotten hurt, what could have been? I could have done this, I could have done that. And I think we're seeing uh, a great example of what could have been had Jay Vickers been able to stay healthy. Because here he is so many years after the fact. He graduated in 99. So we're almost a full 10 years after he left Notre Dame's campus and he's still got tremendous athletic ability. And what a personal testament for him to be able to close a chapter and a page in his book and feel very good about what he's done on the field today. And finally, actually playing for Lou Holtz in a game. That never happened as Holtz left after the 96 season, his injured freshman year. Wooden with the handoff. Pernell Taylor finds some room on the left side. The La Brea Heights running back. In the mid-80s, graduated in 87. Now an officer with the Los Angeles Police Department. This is just a belly zone inside. He cuts back a little bit, covering the football up, making sure he's not going to fumble. That's another thing that Coach Holt stresses. But clearly, Tom, it seems the game plan and the changes they made at the second half was to be physical and putting the game on the offensive line. If they're going to win, we need to do it up front with the players that we have. And right now we're seeing as the Notre Dame's run game is coming alive. What do you think Lou Holtz told his team at the half to get them to play more physical? <laughs> you probably didn't have to tell him much. I know these guys were chomping off the bench, uh, chopping off the bit. But oddly enough, Coach Holtz isn't a big rah-rah speech guy. He's great. He's very quick-witted. He's got the, you know the funny things he does. But he claims that he's not a big speech guy because when he was in high school, he said he heard the most amazing pregame speech he had ever heard given by his high school coach. He said he was ready to run through fire, to eat nails, to take bullets for his team. He was on the kickoff squad. He runs down, and about halfway down the field, he absolutely gets ear-holed. Some player hits him so hard it knocks him off his feet, and his helmet may have come off. And Coach Holt said at that moment he didn't have any idea what his coach had said. He couldn't remember a thing. So from that standpoint, and from then on, he said he wasn't a big believer in pregame speeches because you're just one hit away from forgetting what the coach said. And his point was, we get ready for the game Monday through Friday, not on Saturday morning. Another carry for Jay Vickers up the middle, but dropped in the backfield by Atsushi Fujita. One of the most famous pregame speeches given by Lou Holtz before the Miami game, the national championship season, was perhaps one of the briefest. Unbelievable. A lot of Notre Dame fans remember the 1988 matchup between Miami and Notre Dame where they got into the fight and pregame in the tunnel. They start going on and talking with Rocket over the years. He describes the story. He said it just all of a sudden became a melee, and he started getting you know pushed around. So he jumps into the stands. He says he looks over, and Tony Rice is jacking some guy up in the face mask, and Dean Brown, number 71, the big left tackle, he's punching somebody. So Rocket from the stands starts kicking Miami players in the head. They break it up. They go into the locker room, and they know that they're busted. Coach Holtz really stressed playing with class and style, so they – felt that they were going to be in trouble. So they waited for him to come out. It took longer than normal. And Coach Holtz 
comes out and says, men, I saw what happened. It's okay. I only have one request. Save Jimmy Johnson for me. <laughs> Rocket said the whole entire locker room erupts, and he points back to that moment with what Coach Holt said in that brief pregame speech is the moment that they knew not only that they were going to win the Miami game, but that they would win the national championship. Scott Sinja hooks a 45-yard attempt. He's one of two on the day. It's easy to look back but for Rocket with hindsight and say that that was the point where things turned around. But you couldn't have said going into that specific game and here's an interception for Notre Dame. The second pick of the day for the Fighting Irish Legends. And Mike Goolsby will take this one back inside the 10. Mike Goolsby had a knack, the former captain for Notre Dame. Folks might remember that interception he had for a touchdown versus Tennessee his senior year in 2004. Mike Goolsby has a nose for the football, comes up with a huge play and a turnover for the defense there. Sugarwara drops back, doesn't see Goolsby fold back inside, thinks he has the receiver open, but Goolsby does a great job of sitting in his zone and protecting underneath, which is exactly what he's supposed to do for his cornerback. The quarterback throws it right to him. He was in position to make the play. Congratulated at the end by Ivory Covington. He had an interception in 2000 on the last play against Hamburg. And first and goal now from the eight-yard line. Second pick of the day for Notre Dame. Ron Israel had one in the first half. Both quarterbacks for Japan have now thrown one to the Notre Dame team. And up the middle goes Vickers on first down. The carry for Jay Vickers, who has turned into the workhorse here. He's brought down by Yasuo Wakisaka. Wakisaka is 39 years old, the oldest player on the Japan team. He said coming in, I still want to play as long as I can move my body. He's a perennial all-league selection in the Japan X League. My partner over here apparently can't move his body. He decided not to suit him. Well, Thomas, like I always say, brother, I could get hurt in a pillow fight. And these guys out here playing so physical, even the ones that were in shape, said that it took a while for them to get used to the physical nature and the pounding of playing football again. Football is the only sport that you can't simulate. You have to go through it to practice to get used to it. All other sports, you can shoot jump shots, you can go to the batting cages, you can shoot whatever it is you want to do for whatever sport you're playing maybe skate a little bit but in football you have to be able to put pads on and go at it to be able to get used to it and these guys just simply haven't had that luxury so for them to come out here and be in control of this game up by nine at the end of the third quarter is pretty impressive we talk about strapping the pads on for this notre dame legends team and quite literally, they'll leave them behind when they leave Tokyo after this game. The Notre Dame players will keep their jerseys, but they'll leave their helmets and they'll leave all of their pads back behind to uh, give away to Japanese teams to help them leave some equipment for one of the lasting effects of this Notre Dame Japan Bowl. Second and goal from the two. Wooden has it on the option pitch to Vickers. He gets the one and stretches in. Got it over the pylon, but there's a flag on the play. Great strength by Jay Vickers to power over the top of Kuki Kato. And to shove the linebacker into the end zone, and Vickers says that was a face mask. One thing he didn't have to worry about playing flag football last summer. There are no face masks in flag football. Touchdown, Notre Dame. And the Notre Dame legends waiting on the extra point lead Japan 18 to 3. Just a great job right there of keeping the football good pitch. Vickers using that stiff arm again and being very physical to get across the football. Great stiff arm, drives. Oh, his left foot may have been out there, Tom. I don't know if there's replay in this game, but the referees took a look at it and Scored touchdown, but apparently stepped out. You want to email Jay and tell him that you want to take six away from him? No, never do that. If there's anybody that deserves to score a touchdown in a game like this, it's Jay Vickers. And I'm not hateful like that. <laughs> Jay, I want everybody to succeed. <laughs> you, know, you can ask his son about it. Jay's a father of three. His uh, oldest son, Jamal, will be a freshman at Clovis North High School. 
in Fresno this fall. His younger son, Jalen, is just nine years old. He always he already knows he wants to be an offensive coordinator. <laughs> wow. He's, he's got the game system out, runs through plays. I'm sure playing NCAA football 10. Exactly. And coordinating through the video games. There's a flag on the play again. Well, I know you get hurt a lot less being a coach. But there's not nearly as much job security. Go against Notre Dame, Sinja. We'll have another opportunity. How about the Notre Dame coaching staff? Loaded this year. Or for this game, I should say. Bill Lewis coaching the defensive backs, the head coach at Georgia Tech, but much more successfully at East Carolina and Wyoming. Gary Darnell coaching the linebackers. And then you got guys like Chris Zorich, Reggie Brooks, Tim Brown, all part of the part of the party and out there coaching. And so is Lou. <laughs> My man hasn't missed a beat. He does everything at one speed when it comes to football, and that's with intensity. That's the one thing that Coach Holtz brings to everything he does. He does it to his best of his ability. And that's what he tried to teach his players and emulate through example is you got to care. You got to go through life caring about other people and caring about what you do. And Coach Holtz has lived that to a T. Interesting story on the bus ride over today. Jeremy Akers stood a, uh, stole a couple glances at Lou Holtz's manila folder that he was writing some notes on before the game. Yeah, he did. And one of the things that he saw was on the back of the folder after he talked to him, after he had written down some of the plays that they were going to run and some of the thoughts that he had, he had some notes that he paid particular attention to that said, after we win, after we win. And on that, Coach Holtz, again, as we talked about, was getting ready for what he was going to say to the players and how to conduct themselves with class after they won the ball game. And that wasn't a knock on Japan's team. It's really a testament of how much confidence he had. And right now, his team's playing like a. The Notre Dame touchdown set up by the second interception of the day by the Notre Dame defense, Mike Goolsby, with the pick and the return to put Notre Dame inside the five. And then Jay Vickers took it the rest of the way. And Lou Holtz, his squad, looking at another victory. Sinja banged the extra point through. Coach Holtz also had pick up laundry and mow the lawn on that list, too, as well. <laughs> Two plays, six-yard drive. They started at the eight, and uh, it's been a successful journey for Jay Vickers. A 6,299-mile trip from Chicago to Tokyo. This Notre Dame squad and the traveling party quite literally chased the sun across the earth. They saw 26 consecutive hours of sunshine on their flight. In a wide range of ages, 23-year-old guard Thomas Beeman Durfer and wide receiver Chris Haynes at 52 years young, the oldest player on the Notre Dame roster. Notre Dame fans remember Haynes' name, but to the Casual college football fan, it's kind of hard to get a feel for where Chris Haynes ranks in terms of Notre Dame history. So all you need to know about Chris Haynes, who was one of the leading receivers in the late 70s, is that he caught the game-winning touchdown pass as time expired from Joe Montana in the 1979 iced over Cotton Bowl. For Montana, the chicken soup game, playing sick, came back in to lead Notre Dame to come from behind when they trailed by 22 with 12 minutes left. And Haynes from Akron, Ohio, was on the receiving end of the game winner. You have never seen that game. I have never seen that game. I've heard about it. I've certainly read about it. I've met Chris. I've met Joe Montana. But that's a game I've never seen. But you can't say that. You've actually seen that game, Tom. Tom Hart, along with former Notre Dame All-American Aaron Taylor. I had the opportunity to play high school football. I wasn't playing at your level, but I played high school football back in Missouri, and the defensive coordinator for my high school team was Dan Devine Jr. Wow. And every year, Dan Devine Jr. broke out the reels, took us into the film room, and showed this high school team from Missouri, which happened to wear green and gold, the entire game tape and footage from the 79 Cotton Bowl, which included 
a young Dan Devine with his father coaching on the sidelines playing catch with Joe Montana in the ice in the sleet getting him warmed up to go in for the decisive fourth quarter and the attitude that he was trying to bring to a high school team and the thought process could be applied to any team especially those coached by Lou Holtz is that you never give up no matter what the deficit is in the fourth quarter if you keep fighting you'll find a way to win what is underscored though is if you have Joe Montana it's a lot easier to find a way to win. <laughs> and it's interesting because Joe Montana wasn't Joe Montana as he's known now until after he got in the NFL he was a good college quarterback but he certainly didn't light things up but I think if you take a look at Joe Montana's professional career throwing late fourth quarter winning touchdowns you have to think that plays like that to Chris Haynes certainly played a part in his development as being a comeback kid Ivory Covington with the stop for Notre Dame, leading 19 to 3 here in the third quarter from the Tokyo Dome. And a timeout used by Notre Dame. Pardon me, the end of the quarter, and they'll switch sides. Japan here in the Tokyo Dome will head over towards home plate as we end the third quarter with the Fighting Irish Legends leading Japan 19 to 3. Tourists like to flock to the Tokyo Tower, located in Shiba Park here in Tokyo. The tallest self-supporting steel structure in the world, one over 1,000 feet tall. It'll be 333 meters, Aaron. Yes, I was uh, converting that in my head as you were mentioning that. Should have left the advocates at home, 19-3. to three. Notre Dame with the lead over Japan as we start the fourth quarter. And they go back to the starting quarterback, Takata, and he has a completion. To Akiyama. Akiyama finally dropped by Ron Israel and, and Mike Goolsby. They've both been very busy on the defensive end. Good adjustment by the Japan team. This is the thing that worked for them. Takata being back in the game after he got knocked back early. Distribute the ball in the spread very quickly inside on the slant. He's patient there, lets his receiver come underneath, and then one, two, three, four missed tackles until he finally brings them down. If Japan can hit a couple more of those, they could get back into this ball game. But Notre Dame's defense, to their credit, has been bending but not breaking. Nakiyama, a veteran of the Japanese Pro League, played college ball at Kwanzai and has participated in their national championship, their Super Bowl, they're called the Rice Bowl. Try to set up the screen. Goolsby is there once again to take down Ken Shimizu. Shimizu played in the previous Japan Bowl game against the United States. Oscar Taco, Lotto down, 43. 50 penalty, all Horse collar. I didn't know that would be in effect today. Hey, these are college rules, and these these referees have done a great job, this officiating staff, of staying on top of it, keeping guys safe. The horse collar penalty, of course, implemented when you grab a player behind the back and immediately bring him down. It's an automatic 15-yard penalty. If you grab him by the back and drag him down over three or four yards, it's, of course, not a penalty. But Mike Goolsby sniffed that one out immediately and, unfortunately, needs to wrap up, not around his neck. Horse collar penalty is a new rule in college football, just a couple years old. Are you in favor of it? I am. It's designed to keep players healthy, but it's also one of those things where there's a fine balance between trying to take the aggressive and physical nature out of it. It happens to be one of those things where they were seeing a lot of knee and ankle and back injuries from guys getting tackled that way, so it's something that uh, the officiating staff and the rules committee got together and felt would be a good way to keep players safer. Option keeper for Takata. He's inside the five-yard line. That Hasbrook, who had a safety earlier this half for Notre Dame, was in on the stop along with Ron Israel. And Takata doing a pretty good job leading this Japan offense. Really good. Japan's doing a good job of moving the football, and they're mixing it up. This time he keeps the ball, gets back up inside. And you remember, early on in that initial drive where they were able to march down the field and get a field goal, and the first drive of the game where they were marched down and went out on downs, the thing that they did consistently was mix up the run and pass. When Japan's gotten away from that and tried to throw it only, Notre Dame's pass rush has been all over them. So the way that they're doing a good job of moving the ball this drive is by keeping Notre Dame off balance. Takata has to use a timeout second of the half for Japan. Second timeout. 13.06 to go in the game from the Tokyo Dome. 
Notre Dame Legends, coached by legendary head coach Lou Holtz. And it's not necessarily the biggest names that are having the biggest day. Jay Vickers has been fantastic for Notre Dame today. And the 31-year-old who's now an associate athletic director at Fresno State battled injuries throughout his career at Notre Dame. Not a problem here. We mentioned his, his 40 time in their April tryouts. 4 5 40. He said it was friendly clock. <laughs> Very friendly clock. You don't Down, downhill. We ran downhill. Put the wind behind our backs. You want to break a guy's confidence right out of the gate. <laughs> Bro, you're in a 4 9. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I would think that it, with the economy this day and age, it, you adjust for the recession, 4 or 5, pretty good for a 31-year-old. Yeah, no question. You adjust for inflation, you adjust for the economy. I mean, that's that's <laughs> like 4-2 in high school. That's right. Second of five now for Japan. Knocking on the door, looking for their first touchdown of the game inside the red zone. Play action. To the end zone, incomplete. Coverage in the corner that time from a Johnny Sanders. That was a Johnny Sanders on the coverage for her name. Johnny Let's Sanders go. doing a great job of okay, being physical. Okay. Notre Dame being a little too physical, okay. roughing the passer on that one. It's going to be a critical penalty, one song, of the things that Coach Holtz doesn't want. But on that coverage, Johnny Sanders did a good job. And again, Notre Dame's defensive line and their front four doing a good job of coming through and creating pressure. Knocking down to Cotta on that play. A little bit late, though. There's some question coming into this game whether or not Notre Dame could keep up with Japan's team speed, as you see the penalties now. Irish have been flagged 10 times today, giving up 73 yards. The secondary has been fantastic for Notre Dame, keeping up with that speed. There were a couple of busted plays for Japan that they missed opportunities on, but in the second half, that hasn't been an issue. Miscommunication and busted play, another flag. And Japan with a new quarterback. I don't know what you would call this now, but they put in Noriaki Kinoshita in at center. I, you could call it, I don't know, the Wild Japan formation. I mean, <laughs> the Wild Dragon, maybe? Virginia Tech will have the Wild Turkey formation this season with a. <laughs> Huge tight end taking direct snaps, but Kanashita is the, the poster boy for American football success in Japan. A standout kick returner in NFL Europe, which has since folded. And this is his first game on Japanese soil since 2005 when he played for Ritsumeikin, and they lost to Matsushita in the Rice Bowl National Championship. He also spent time in, outside of Atlanta, Flowery Branch, Georgia, with the Atlanta Falcons preseason camp three times. And he was three times their Coaching Bowl MVP. Won the Mills Cup, several honors. As you see, Benny Gilbo. Benny Gilbo being taken off the field for Notre Dame. And he said, he said this is a unique opportunity for Kanashita. When he was trying to make the Falcons and in the NFL, he said it was different. Until now, I was one Japanese battling with Americans. Now I'm on a Japanese team against American. And that's a great feeling. He said he's been a Notre Dame fan for a long time. His high school in Osaka wore the same colors at Notre Dame. I think that's really a testament to the presence of Notre Dame football. When you think around the world, it's probably the most famous brand of any of the uh, American colleges out there would be Notre Dame. It's just an icon to the American football game. The Irish have been through a rough patch in the last, you know, decade or so and not having the success that they're used to having. But still, the pool and the, and the, the Golden Dome and the Newt Rockney and the history and tradition uh, kind of is pervasive and kind of transcends cultural borders. And for him to say that he is familiar with Notre Dame is, is not a shocker. Who knows? We may get back on the uh, back on the national scene, Tom. Maybe a BCS game this year for the old Irish. Ten wins would likely do it, wouldn't it? Yep. Depending on uh, what the rest of the landscape looks like. 
got a very favorable schedule. They should be favored to win all of their road games, of which there's only four. They do play a game on a neutral site in San Antonio. But they're favored in their road games, and they get USC at home, their toughest appoint, uh, opponent. So if they're favored in all their games until that USC game in October, if they could win that game and stay undefeated, get a couple bounces that go the right way and clean up some of the miscues that they had last year, run the football, protect the football a little bit better, create some pressure and turnovers on defense. The old Irish could be a dark horse to make a run, but there's a lot of ifs in that equation. Third and goal, fire to the end zone and incomplete. Again, that time it was Israel on the coverage. It, I, I really like what Notre Dame is doing with their scheduling in the coming years. Pardon me, that was a Johnny Sanders on the coverage. Gary Darnell, the defensive coordinator for this game for Notre Dame. And that includes, you mentioned playing neutral site games. They'll go overseas in a couple years to take on Navy. But they will also play at the new Yankee Stadium. And they'll take on Army. That's about building your brand, getting presence, going into deep recruiting beds. New Jersey uh, is, is a great recruiting bed. A lot of players coming out of there. They've lost a lot to USC over the years. It's been able to pull some great players out of there. Going down into Texas, that's a hot bed of recruiting. Notre Dame, when it's successful, recruits well in the Midwest, but it's not afraid to be able to pull players out. So the games not only make financial sense, it also helps their program in a lot of other ways as well. As a player, would you rather play those neutral site games or be at home at Notre Dame? I'd rather be at home, but it is kind of a fun experience, kind of a, a mini bowl game. But the bottom line is a business trip's a business trip, and I'd rather be at home where we have the crowd noises and advantage. Japan went for it on fourth down. They turned the ball over in the Notre Dame red zone. Return to the Tokyo Dome right after this. Coach Mori, former defensive coordinator, saw his offense go for it on fourth down and turn the ball over. He was, well, Coach Mori, by the way, spent some time in NFL Europe. He was with the Amsterdam Admirals and Notre Dame takes over on downs and a first down run up the gut for eight yards for a familiar name now Jay Vickers well I would expect with Notre Dame being up by 16 in the fourth quarter <laughs> and based off what they've done from the three previous quarters we're going to see some physical grinded out football and we all know that Jay Vickers has the ability to break big runs so it wouldn't surprise me if very soon here we see Vickers break out of the backfield and get some big yardage maybe even a touchdown this time so he doesn't have to get teased by his teammates. Or teased by Aaron Taylor from the broadcast booth. Here's Vickers on the left side. Stopped short of the first down. Looks like from here, Atsushi Fujita, 23-year-old in on the stop. You started to compare him on his 77-yard run to a gazelle, which I think would be uh, very favorable with great speed. And then you changed it to giraffe. Well, it was more reminiscent of, of and more indicative of his stride length and the kind of gallop with the head back where he had the kind of half circle in his back trying to get extra speed than it was necessarily how fast he was running. He wasn't eating leaves at the time? No, he wasn't. Well, Vickers has been a bright spot for Notre Dame on offense. So has Ambrose Wooden, who's taken over under center. Third and one. These Notre Dame legends getting a chance to play one more game. And that's a first down plunge for Brandon Hoyt. And, you know, as a player, Aaron, you had as successful a career as anybody, two-time All-American, as Marcus Thorne now goes down with an injury, originally a walk-on from Carmel, Indiana, now an orthopedic surgeon, and he'll need some attention. Can't operate on yourself, though, so we'll see. hope Marcus Thorne is okay. Yeah, Ambrose Wooden is remembered sometimes for the wrong reasons. In that Bush push game against USC, Dwayne Jarrett on fourth and 13 hauled in a pass over Wooden that turned the tide and let USC back in the game on their game-winning drive. A lot of people forget a lot of the good things that he did at Notre Dame, and I think as a player that really illustrates that it can be one play, good or bad, that defines your career. No question. We just talked about Chris Haynes earlier, and that certainly defined his career. And, and to Ambrose Wooden's defense, he was covered pretty dang well on Dwayne Jarrett, and it was a great thrown ball at his back shoulder, and uh, you can't cover it any more well than he did. Unfortunately, he came out on the wrong side of the ball, but I think his career and the other things he'd done 
uh, speak more for itself than just that one play. But I think you're right. Unfortunately, sometimes one play can define a player's career. Uh, and for the players themselves, you know, sometimes players, because they're so hard on themselves, will have a great career but make one critical mistake, and that'll be the thing that sticks out because you never oftentimes in football get a chance to go back and make up for that uh, once you retire. So this is great for Ambrose to be able to come here and put some icing on what's already a pretty good cake for him. Back in the blue and gold and playing for head coach Lou Holtz. Now Ambrose Wooden was recruited by Ty Willingham to Notre Dame. In the defensive backfield for Charlie Weiss. He keeps it on his own this time. He had to turn around his life as just a youngster. And he said getting into the Gilman School in Baltimore, private school, was one of the biggest changes and influences that impacted his life as a whole. Another one, is, uh, though, was his brother, Juan Carter. His older brother was a high school dropout. But when he saw that he was such a big role model for his younger brother, Ambrose, he started to turn his life around. He was working construction and doing just that. When he was injured, brain damaged, and partially blinded in a hit-and-run accident in Baltimore, in their hometown. And Ambrose always used his brother Juan as motivation, as an example of how to do the right thing. But most importantly, you know, sometimes guys can be used as a bad example. And that could be just as effective when his brother dropped out of school. Ambrose and Juan, his brother, didn't realize just how valuable education could be. Shortly thereafter, Ambrose had a chance to go to private school at the Gilman School. And he said that turned his life around immediately. And that's been the case for a lot of players that Notre Dame has made that significant difference. I think inherently there's a certain type of player that's attracted to Notre Dame, a guy that wants to graduate, a guy that inherently knows education is a place for him, a place where they don't have names on the back of the jerseys, where you're, you're part of something bigger than yourself. So I think the type of players that it takes to compete uh, or to recruit and want to go to a Notre Dame is inherently different. But Really, I think people, to be successful, you have to be in the right sort of environment. And Ambrose is one of many examples of where a kid comes from uh, such a not good situation, gets around and into and plugged into uh, an area and into a system that is supportive of them, and they just gel. And that's some of the things that I think are important for all young people is to be part of something special. And whether it's sports or athletics uh, at Notre Dame or elsewhere, it's important to be and feel part of a special team. Just kind of like I do right here with you, Tom. <laughs> the start of something great. 16-point <laughs> lead for the Notre Dame legends with the Notre Dame legend next to me in the broadcast booth, Ambrose Wooden. With the keeper again, bounces it outside, fights towards the first down. Ryoi Imanishi forces him down as we get ready for our maiden voyage in CBS College Sports and college football this fall throughout the Mountain West Conference and Conference USA. Aaron, one thing for certain, our pronunciation guides will be a lot simpler once we get to <laughs> September. Let's hope, and let's hope we see his physical football as we're seeing now Ambrose Wooden doing a good job of taking it up inside there. And interestingly enough, it's the defensive players, Ambrose Wooden, Brandon Hoyt, who are making a tremendous offensive impact in this game today. Second and one. Vickers got hit in the backfield, stays on his feet, and he chugs his way towards the chain for seemingly a Notre Dame first down. All right, we got college football now. The 2009 season, less than right at a, a month away, less than a month away now as we get towards the home stretch of the summer. Who are you looking forward to this year? Well, I, I, I'll, I hate to use the favorite pick, but I want to see Florida and what they can do. They've got so many returners starting. Tim Tebow has taken a lot of heat for a lot of different things. But if anybody's got a chance to win two Heismans, it's going to be him with the groundswell of support that he has. The SEC is going to be thick, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the Conference USA. Tom, you and I are going to have a chance to be able to cover, cover some of those teams. Lou Holtz's son, Skip, done a great job with ECU. They won the championship last year behind a great defense led by Greg Hudson. Uh, Southern Miss has a thousand yard receiver uh, and DeAndre Brown has been a little banged up and we're watching a great run right here by Jay Vickers being physical. <laughs> what a great job. I think when you talk about we'll go back to the Conference USA in a minute but look how tired he is. 
hit and spin and doing all the things that he's doing. When you talk about teams getting worn down in the fourth quarter, this is a textbook example of it. Japan is worn out. Notre Dame has worn them down and is out physicaling them in the fourth quarter, not wrapping up on tackles, not really dropping their head, getting taken along for the ride right there, just overpowered. Jay Vickers doing a good job. Japan just doesn't have enough to compete physically. Not bad for a giraffe. I just hope that Jay Vickers is in business class in the flight home can stretch out a little bit. 118 yards for Vickers and a touchdown. And Notre Dame. The ball on the Japan 28 yard line. Cole Locks makes his home in Chicago now. Had the carry. Former walk-on fullback at Notre Dame. Finished his career in 2004. But Skip Holtz will certainly have some talent there. Southern Miss will have some talent, as you mentioned. But it was the Mountain West Conference last year which made enormous strides, especially against automatic qualifying BCS schools. When you, you think about the fact that the worst team in the Mountain West, San Diego State, had Notre Dame on the ropes at Notre Dame and maybe the second worst team Wyoming went on the road and won at Tennessee a lot of people forget about the depth of the Mountain West Conference they focus on Utah's undefeated season and the shellacking of Alabama and the Sugar Bowl but there was talent from top to bottom in TCU which will be loaded once again and a guy you know very well Dick Bumpus the defensive coordinator is primed for another great season Dick Bumpus, the former Notre Dame defensive line coach, uh, had the unfortunate pleasure of walking uh, him and a lot of his players and Bryant Young and Jim Flanagan, Chris George, during the time that he was there. Uh, coach Bumpus has done a great job with that defense. TCU is, they talk about BCS busters. There's nobody that I would have any hesitation lining TCU up on a Saturday and not think that they have a chance to win. They were that good. Of course, they played Oklahoma last year and uh, gave up some points early on underneath routes that turned into very big plays for him. Um, went on the road and lost to Utah, but it's really, really deep in talent across the board. BYU with Max Hall coming back. They lose some of their offensive linemen, so they'll be rebuilding a little bit, but they're going to be the favorite to maybe win the Mountain West Conference. But it's the big three rounded out by Utah who has some uh, some gaps to fill offensively, but it's still going to be a very good team. So it's a very top-heavy Mountain West Conference. Even though there's depth all the way through, those are going to be the three that people are going to be focusing on, although there is some good talent down at the bottom. I think UNLV is going to be a better team this year. TCU will have an opportunity to make noise in their out-of-conference schedule. They'll have two very winnable road games. It will be headline grabbers at Virginia. And Al Groh's team will struggle this season. And on the road at Clemson. And so there is no more Oklahoma on that schedule. They'll get a chance to, for a big win. BYU does have Oklahoma on the schedule. They'll meet in Jerry Jones' new playground in the new Cowboys Stadium to start the season. They also have Florida State coming to Provo. So, it, you know, if you're talking about Mountain West or Conference USA teams, you always need that opportunity to take down big-name teams. That's why Skip Holtz and East Carolina were so successful at the opening of last season grabbing both Virginia Tech and West Virginia. And you have to be able to schedule those non-conference games. And the teams that are going to be successful that want to have a legitimate shot at going have to be able to do that. That's something that BYU certainly has an opportunity to do. If you catch Oklahoma slipping right out of the gates with their rebuilt offensive line, you're going to make a name for yourself. And if you follow that up by beating an ACC team uh, in Florida State that should be better this year, particularly on offense, I think you're going to have uh, an opportunity to be able to make that case but the the non-conference scheduling is becoming so much of an issue in so many different areas in college football you look at the bigger heavyweights trying to shy away from the competition and the the teams that are from the quote-unquote mid-majors in the Mountain West and the Conference USA conferences are having to schedule some of the heavyweights and literally basically having to earn their way in the right to get to the dance and most of the time doing that on the road. On fourth down, Notre Dame went for it. Japanese line stood up. And the Fighting Irish turned it over on downs, but do a great job of whittling away that clock. 3.32 to go from the Tokyo Dome. It's Notre Dame 19, Japan 3 on CBS College Sports.
Notre Dame has dominated time of possession down the stretch, holding on to a 19 to 3 lead. They turn it over on downs, and Japan will take over. This passing offense needs to connect to climb back into this game, and, and they do just that on first down with the pass complete to Noriaki Kinashita. Japan's really got to get something going offensively. I mean, I'm stating the obvious here, but with their ability to be able to move the football and, and, and with the pass game, I think they've got to be able to find something to get something generated offensively. Notre Dame, of course, has done a great job of bending but not breaking. We said it several times today, but Japan, if they have a chance to be in this game with only three minutes left, they're going to have to take some shots downfield. For wide, as is custom for this Japanese offense and pass complete to Choi Hasegawa. Hasegawa, 26 year old, plays for Panasonic Electric Works. Just a crossing route on here, coming, excuse me, an out route, doing a good job of running outside the coverage, coming underneath, gets a, looks like a seven yard gain, taking some quick shots. But at some point, Japan's going to have to take some shots downfield to be able to eat up a 16-point differential in less than two minutes or three minutes. Fourth grab for Hashigawa. Quick release that time and complete for a first down to Koji Yoniyama. Yoniyama plays for the Fujitsu Frontiers in the Japan X League. Play a lot of Lady Gaga in the X League, I assume. <laughs> and the majority of the players on this Japan national team have been drawn from four powerhouses in the X League. Fujitsu is well represented. They have 14 players on this team. There's a scramble by Takata. And it'll be just shy of the first down. That will leave second and one with the clock ticking. Nearing the two-minute mark in the Notre Dame-Japan Bowl with the Notre Dame Legends team leading Japan 19-3. It's a classic case of having to know where the flag stick is. He was about a half a yard short of getting that first down, kept the clock moving, throws it out of bounds to stop the clock now. With less than two minutes, unless they score here pretty quickly, it's going to look tough for Japan. But we've seen their ability to be able to strike quick. We talked about their athleticism that they have on the outside. And all in all, I think Japan competed very, very tough today, regardless of the outcome of this game. They've certainly got a ways to go, but this is exactly what Coach Mori was talking about. It's a great measuring stick. I think what they'll be able to take away from this game is that they need to get bigger. They need to get phys more physical um, and to be able to give themselves an additional opportunities to take advantage of very comparable and athletic skill positions on the outside. Fourth and one. This Notre Dame Legends team coached by Lou Holtz tried to replicate as much uh, of the Notre Dame experience as they could coming over here for this game. They even brought a miniature play like a champion shot, a sign. It was uh, instead of over the top of the door to the right of the doors as the Notre Dame players came out of their locker room. A scramble for the first down for Takata. Big fourth down pick up there. You, you mentioned the play like a champion sign. That's something that even through my professional career, as I would go out onto the field, I would whether there was a sign or anything there or not, there was, sometimes I hit exit signs, but always symbolically I would hit the play like a champion sign as I walked out on the field as a reminder that I needed to go out there and do my best no matter what. Do you have one in the stairwell of your house? Yes, it's uh, walk like a champion. I have one on the refrigerator, eat like a champion. <laughs> <laughs> you get one for the broadcast booth this season, announced like a champion. That's right. Tom Hart, along with Aaron Taylor, second and seven now as the Notre Dame Japan Bowl Nears the close with a minute 33 to go. And it bears repeating that this Notre Dame team only had eight practices together. And as a whole, yeah, it's been sloppy and there's been some flags, but as a whole, they've played to pretty well together as a team. There, there were times where they were busted assignments defensively, but Lou Holtz's team caught some breaks when Japan was unable to capitalize. 
No question. And, and that Holtz, Coach Holtz, a lot of people know, has a philosophy about how we win. The, the acronym, first of all, win, what's important now? He's always talking about what's the next step in the process, what's important now for us to do. But when he talks about how we win, he talks about out hitting and being more physical, fundamentals, togetherness, no turnovers. These are the commandments, no turnovers, no missed assignments, no foolish penalties. Win the goal line. Win third down in the kicking game. One in every six plays during a football game is special team. So that was something that always took precedence. We practiced it in the middle of the practice while players were still fresh and always took precedence. It's something that never got overlooked because of the predominance and the weight that Coach Holtz put on it. Finally, no big plays and to make big plays on offense, which were over 20 yards. And the last but not least was don't flinch. This is probably the defining thing that I took away from Coach Holtz, that at some point during the game, something was going to go wrong. Expect it and don't flinch. And I think that single thing allowed us to win and come out of certain situations where other teams would have folded, we found ways to succeed. And they fold up to Kata on another sack for the Notre Dame defense. That time it was Greg Pauley. Milwaukee native in with the stop. Paulie has played on both lines today. A little O-line action and now gets a sack from the defensive line from his tackle position. This is great. This is like going back to high school, playing both ways, doing what you're doing. Great swim move off the right side, comes off the left and just beats his defender. This is something we've seen all game long, that Notre Dame defensive line coached by Chris Zorich, one of the meanest, toughest nose tackles to ever play college football, also a Hall of Famer himself, doing a great job coaching up his unit today. As night falls outside of the Tokyo Dome, a 19-3 lead for Notre Dame with under a minute to go as the legends look to wrap up this visit with a victory. After the game, you can find Aaron on the Ferris wheel. <laughs> I like Ferris wheel and cotton candy. I think big fella will go through some cotton candy this fall, don't you? I got, I got a sweet tooth, man. Notre Dame keeps it on the ground. One of the first carries for Tim O'Neill. Originally a, a walk on at Notre Dame. And an author. He wrote every play every day. My life as a Notre Dame walk on in 2006. He's now a natural gas trader. See Coach Holtz there talking with Reggie Brooks. The hug. That's really reminiscent of the Notre Dame family. When it's all said and done, it comes down to the people you meet. Caring and believing in people and being trustworthy. And we just saw that with two of Notre Dame's greats and running back Reggie Brooks and Coach Lou Holtz. On the ground again, Pernell Taylor will get back to his job with the LAPD when Notre Dame returns stateside. But for now, he's got the final carry in this game off of a handoff from Ambrose Wooden. And Notre Dame with a 19-3 victory over Japan in the Tokyo Dome. Hall of Famer Lou Holtz with some parting words as they celebrate 75 years of football in Japan. More to come from Tokyo after this. Post-game festivities from the Tokyo Bowl where Notre Dame flies halfway around the world to nab a victory in the Notre Dame Japan Bowl. Tom Hart with Aaron Taylor and Aaron, a successful trip for the Notre Dame legends. No question. We talked about this was going to be a great opportunity for the Notre Dame players. It was to relive the glory, to put the golden helmet one more time. They came a halfway across the world and got it done. Go Irish. Final score, Notre Dame 19, Japan 3 for Aaron Taylor. I'm Tom Hart. For the latest scores, news, highlights, and analysis, log on to cbscollegesports.com. This has been a presentation of CBS College Sports, the pulse of college sports.